And to our listening guests, I do apologize for our late start as we did have some housekeeping matters to address. At this time, I wish to read for the record a letter received by the Honorable Carvin Malone, territorial member. This letter was received today, February 2nd, 2023, and it reads as follows. After careful consideration and consultation, it has been decided that I would vacate my post as a member of His Majesty's loyal opposition and rejoin my Virgin Islands Party colleagues as a member of the backbench in the Government of National Unity with immediate effect. I wish to thank the people of the Virgin Islands for their support, understanding, and appreciation of the impart of information from my post as opposition member, and I pledge to continue the discharge of all relevant information, save for topics of national security and those limited by protocol. Signed, Honorable Carvin Malone, Territorial at Large Representative. At this time, I call on the Honorable Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I welcome the Territorial at Large member um, back on the, on the government side. I, Madam Speaker, move a motion to amend the order paper by adding a new item under five, which is presentation of papers A, Roman numeral eight, which is the Government of the Virgin Islands National Sustainable Development Plan of the Citizens of the Virgin Islands. I move a motion to add an item under 5A, and it would be Roman numeral 8, which is the Government of the Virgin Islands National Sustainable Development Plan of this. I'm sorry, Honorable Premier, I believe that's Roman numeral 13. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Math, maths was never my strongest subject. I was a more of an English person. So let me go again, Madam Speaker. I move a motion to amend the order paper by adding a new item under 5A, and this would be Roman numeral 13, which is Government of the Virgin Islands National Sustainable Development Plan of the Citizens of the Virgin Islands. I also propose to amend the order paper by adding a new item under eight, which is public business, one, and this would be a Roman numeral one, which would be the introduction and first reading of the bill entitled Police Act 2023. Madam Speaker, I so move. Madam Speaker, I rise to second a motion. Honorable members, a motion has been moved and seconded to amend the order of the day to reflect as follows. To add a new Roman numeral 13 under 5A of presentation of papers and to add a new number eight, which will be public business, one government business introduction and first reading the Police Act 2023. All other items currently on the order of the day will be sequentially renumbered. Those in favor? 
Do's against, the eyes have it, the order of day has been so amended. I now call on the Honorable Premier. Madam. Madam Speaker, I, I move a motion. Uh, my apologies, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I stand to lay on the table the following document. Uh, Government of the Virgin Islands National Sustainable Development Plan of the citizens of the Virgin Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Premier. At this time, I call, yes, I'm sorry, Leader of the Opposition. I'm, I'm sorry, Honorable, we can't hear you. You gonna do it? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. I call on the premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move a motion that standing order 14A be suspended to allow for the de debate of the National Sustainable Development Plan of the citizens of the Virgin Islands. Madam Speaker, I rise to second the motion. Thank you. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that standing order number 14A be suspended to allow the debate on the National Sustainable Development Plan of the citizens of the Virgin Islands. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it, the motion is passed. Honorable Premier. Uh, thank you. Madam Speaker, I will now therefore move a motion to debate the National Sustainable Development Plan of the citizens of the Virgin Islands. And I'll speak a little bit about the plan. And I'm sure my good friend, the leader of the opposition, will give me a second. Madam Speaker, I first ask permission to be able to read from the National Sustainable Development Plan. With your permission, I'll, I'll proceed. Please proceed. Madam Speaker, uh, this National Sustainable Development Plan is an undertaking that I am personally very proud of. And I'm glad to have the opportunity to lay it on the table of the House and for us to say a few words to signify this very historic occasion. I will read from the message that is included in the National Sustainable Development Plan from myself as Premier and Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, it says, the National Sustainable Development Plan, Vision 2036, building a sustainable Virgin Islands is indeed a comprehensive roadmap to guide the development and advancement of the Virgin Islands and fulfilling the aspirations of all the people who call these beautiful islands home. Several features of this plan stand out to inspire confidence in what it signifies and what can be achieved through it. Firstly, the plan was formulated through extensive consultation with the public 
and stakeholders across the various sectors and subsectors. These consultations, numbering 70 sessions, conducted virtually and physically across all of the Virgin Islands, including consultations with the Virgin Islands diaspora, were widely participated in and rich in ideas, views, and suggestions. Thusly, the people of the Virgin Islands can claim ownership of this plan. It was essentially written by the people who will be the ones to bring it into reality, for it was crafted around their vision for themselves and their Virgin Islands. Secondly, sustainability is at the core of this plan. Sustainability is about building, investing, and using resources with tomorrow in mind. This is why, and I'm happy to see it, our vision for empowered youth is prominently stated at the beginning of this plan, with clear guiding principles that capture our responsibilities towards the youth and how they will be molded for their roles as future leaders of their communities and country and how they will be engaged in their country's development. And thirdly, the National Sustainable Development Plan takes a 360-degree view. The recommendations are the results of deep and wide assessments and analysis that interrogate, interrogate where we are at present in our social, economic, and political development our journey and achievements over generations in getting here, our aspirations and where we wish to go, what work is required to get to our vision, and how we can go about getting that work done. It considers the unique history and circumstances of the people of the Virgin Islands and our values, so that the plans and recommendations are reflective of us as a distinctive people in a unique geographic and economic space, and in a political situation that is different to that of other countries, small and large. It is against this context that targets, milestones, and strategies are set, and this represents the empowering organic process that forms the basis of the model democratic society that we are committed to building together. I wish to thank the Economic Commission of Latin America and the Caribbean and head consultant Dr. June Suma for their support and guidance in the development of this National Sustainable Development Plan. Special thanks and commendation also go out to team members Pat Leanne Johnson, Elizabeth Emanuel, Emery Shea Pemberton, and Marietta Headley for their dedication to this project. And I must also include Najan Christopher as well. My sincere appreciation extends to the government of the Virgin Islands, our ministers, permanent secretaries and public officers, the business community, our educational institutions, our civic society, and all our stakeholders who contributed in their respective ways to ensure that we can have a solid plan that is informed by and reflective of our collective aspirations as a Virgin Islands people. I am excited by the prospects of all the amazing things that our Virgin Islands and people can and will achieve through this National Sustainable Development Plan, particularly with respect to sustainable development and ensuring a foundation for success for future generations of Virgin Islanders. I look forward to us all proceeding in earnest with its implementation, and I'm hopeful that all the relevant actors, regardless of political affiliation, will embrace this plan as a mandate from the people of the Virgin Islands for the execution of their vision for their national development. I pledge my personal support and that of my administration as we press forward with our continuing mission of nation building. 
May God bless our efforts to progress our people and grant us the courage, wisdom, and determination to confront and overcome all obstacles in our path. And Madam Speaker, that's signed Dr. Natalio D. Whitley, Premier and Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, I said it in my message, but I repeat my appreciation for all persons who contributed to this plan. Of course, Dr. June Sumer did a marvelous job, along with the team that supported her. She has worked for many, many, many months, worked through very difficult circumstances, through the pandemic, of course, through personal challenges. And um, she has given us a work which truly reflects the people of the Virgin Islands because she did a wonderful job in consultation and reaching out to the various um, sectors, various pockets of people. And she was very extensive, very detailed, very thorough in her work. And I want to extend my appreciation to her and certainly to all other persons who were, were mentioned. Also ECLAC, which we've uh, continued to build on the very strong relationship we have with ECLAC. And that has certainly borne fruit. I also have to acknowledge, of course, that the U United Nations Development Program, or the UNDP, has pledged to support us with the implementation of this plan, which is a very important component of the plan. It is not a plan intended just to rest on the shelves. It is a plan that we want to see implemented, and we have a plan for the implementation of this sustainable development plan, a plan which is being developed right now. Madam Speaker, this National Sustainable Development Plan is an important component of nation building. We are going through some very important exercises at the moment. One is constitutional review, which also is a very important aspect of the nation building process. It has to do with how we see ourselves as a Virgin Islands people and how we see the future. And when we talk about nation building, as a people who are presently a territory of the United Kingdom, you cannot speak about nation building without speaking about self-determination and the process of decolonization. And what that says to us, Madam Speaker, we as a people have to start thinking about who we are and where we want to go in this life. We must also reflect on where we were from whence we came and how we got to where we are today. And I would suggest to you, Madam Speaker, that we are on a trajectory towards greater self-determination, greater self-governance, greater confidence in ourselves, sustainable development, the building of our progressive institutions and the building, above all, of our people. That is the trajectory we are on. And I'm proud, Madam Speaker, that as a member of this Fourth House of Assembly, I've had an opportunity to contribute to that building effort. 
I, I believe very firmly that persons have a better appreciation of things like the 1949 match as a result of some of the things we have done and the restoration of the Legislative Council, like creating holidays, Madam Speaker, um, and changing Territory Day to Virgin Islands Day, doing things like that, and changing Festival Monday to Emancipation Monday and Emancipation Tuesday and Emancipation Wednesday. These things are important and they impact on the consciousness of the people of the Virgin Islands. And having a Heroes and a Four Parents Day so that we can celebrate the accomplishments of Virgin Islanders past and present. Yes, these things are still being worked on and still being fleshed out. But certainly, these efforts have created greater consciousness in the minds of Virgin Islanders about who we are, about where we came from, and about where we have the potential to go if we unify, if we embrace unity, if we embrace the possibilities before us for where we can go if we can only dream and if we can only vision. It says vision 2036. If we can only have the vision to see where we could be through our own collective efforts, we will go far. The sky is the limit for us in the Virgin Islands, Madam Speaker. And we must learn to celebrate ourselves, celebrate our accomplishments, and we must put our heads together and we must walk towards a brighter and a better future, not just for ourselves, but for generations to come. This is a vision for 2036, which is 13, now 13 years away. And we have to be able to project into the future Madam Speaker, I want to speak about the fact that this plan is a non-partisan plan. This plan reflects the will of the people of the Virgin Islands and it was consulted on with the people of the Virgin Islands. This is not a, a, a plan of this administration alone. As persons would notice when they peruse this plan, the, the leader of the opposition has a message in this plan. And it reflects the, not just bipartisan, uh, because of course we have a number of parties in the House, but this, this reflects the whole House and the whole Virgin Islands. And the hope is, because of course we are fast approaching um, campaign time. The hope is that manifestos will embrace the content of this plan. We often hear persons say that our development is stunted because we only plan for four years. And we embrace manifestos every four years. But the concept behind this plan is that all political parties all persons independent candidates, all persons contesting elections, will look at this plan which has been consulted on with the people and passed on behalf of the people and embrace it and say, we commit to this National Sustainable Development Plan moving forward. So we have cohesive, coherent planning and development moving forward. Of course, everybody will want to have their own take on it. And we can challenge ourselves based on how well we have been able to execute the contents of the plan. That's what we'll judge ourselves on as political parties and as individual candidates and incumbents. How well we were able to execute the contents of this plan. How well were we able to put flesh on the bones 
of this kind of skeletal outline and detail of where we want to go over the next 13 years. So I personally commit, Madam Speaker, to following and abiding by this plan as a plan for the whole Virgin Islands. And hopefully persons out there will get a copy of this plan. The citizens of the Virgin Islands, even residents, those persons who have a desire to become a part of the Virgin Islands, that this will become our collective Bible as it pertains to our sustainable development. That this will become our Bible, that we will read it, that we will know it, that we will embrace it, and that we will hold all persons accountable for executing it. This is what it is we are seeking to do. And it is an important exercise. And I cannot minimize or marginalize in any way the significance of what we are doing here today. It's a part of leadership. And I congratulate my colleagues for being here to be able to speak on this and for embracing this plan and my colleagues who passed it through cabinet to get it here to the house. So Madam Speaker, uh, we look forward to a robust debate on this plan. We look forward to the support of colleagues in the House of Assembly on this particular plan and that we would do all within our power to make sure it is in the hands of the people. And Madam Speaker, I very much look forward to advancing not only this plan, but also the implementation plan that will follow, which all um, sectors of the Virgin Islands will have a, a role in, public sector, private sector, civic society, each individual citizen, our communities, etc. So, Madam Speaker, thank you for the opportunity um, to be able to, to, to debate this very significant, this hugely mon monumental undertaking, which is Vision 2036, Building a Sustainable Virgin Islands, the National Sustainable Development Plan of the People of the Virgin Islands. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Premier. I now call on the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the Premier for the fortitude for bringing forward this report today. As we are approaching the 11th hour of this administration and this house, it would have been a terrible disservice if, it, if we had gone through a, a dissolution of the house and the report didn't make it to the house. And further, Madam Speaker, I want to thank you for using your good offices in order to make it possible for us to debate the report. It points out the, the disservice that this house is at and the people of the territory is at for not having the ability to debate reports when they come to the house. 
at the time they are being laid on the table. As the Premier stated, Madam Speaker, I too, as leader of the opposition, does have a message in the report, and I'm going to read that message. The message Be starts... Honorable, I'm sorry, before you go, um, do you wish to start your debate now, or do you wish to first second the motion? I'm not so good at seconding motions, but... No, no, but I second the motion, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Please proceed. Before, before you proceed, let me then open the floor for debate. The floor is now open for debate, honorable members. I call on the leader of the opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the Premier for bringing the report before this Honorable House today. Because I thought, I think that it would have been a disservice, not just to his administration, but to the country, if we had gone through a dissolution of this fifth house. What's house? Fourth house? Fourth house. And not have the benefit of knowing what this report was all about and is all about. I also want to thank you, Madam Speaker, for using your good office and your understanding of the importance of being able to debate this report by allowing us to do so today. As it is, Madam Speaker, we could have laid the report on the table and, and wait for someone to come back and ask for it to be debated. And even so, you couldn't debate it, it had to go to committee. Which the public will never get the opportunity to hear what members think about the report, let alone what's in the report. As the Premier stated, he read his message, that the leader of the opposition does have a message in the report which I will read, Madam Speaker. It says, greetings. It gives me great pleasure to thank Head Consultant Dr. June Sumer Sun and her team for their work and collective genius in putting this very important National Sustainable Development Plan, NSDP, together. I'll also like to thank all those individuals, groups, and organizations, especially ECLAC, who subjected themselves and sacrificed their time in order to make this NSDP a reality. This NSDP, in my view, is complete and comprehensive, given its care and attention to the expressed six goals, health and wellness, education and learning, economy, infrastructure, good governance, and environment. Clearly, it demonstrates that a substantial study was conducted into the needs of our society, and every effort was made through the solicitation of talent and exp expertise with the expressed desire to deliver the best possible outcome. How important is it? Uh, is this NSDP? Very. And I'll also answer it this way. If you had an island, and you wanted it explored, you will produce a roadmap. Similarly, if you wanted to build a functional and cost-effective city, you'll produce a master plan. I'm sure by now you see where I'm going with this. The NSDP also considers justice a part of our development as it addresses the matter of reparations and further encourages monthly lectures on reparatory justice with the aim of establishing a national reparations committee. On this, there's common ground among us. It would have been truly compelling, however, if the NSDP made acknowledgement of the United Nations National Declaration targeting the eradication of colonialism by 2030 
given that it falls within the lifespan of the NSDP. And even more compelling, in my humble view, would have been to have worked the development and fulfillment of the territory's new status of independence into and around the NSDP. Let me conclude by congratulating the government for commissioning the NSDP and to admonish this and future administrations to implement the plan. And may I remind public service servants that they are the custodians of the NSDP with the awesome responsibility of ensuring that all the reviews, all the review periods are met and more importantly that they encourage each sitting administration to follow the NSDP. Sincerely, Julian Fraser, RA. Madam Speaker, the NSDP, which is the National Sustainable Development Plan, covers, it covers a period of 15 years. It's a 15-year plan. And as the Premier stated, it goes up until 2036. And while I'm mention, mentioning time, the timeline, I did say it would have been nice if they had revolved it around the United Nations mandate stipulating that the eradication of uh, colonialism should take place by 2030. So you can see that we'll have six years in, by, by, by the time this plan is exhausted, we would have had six years of independence on, under our belts. I said that, Madam Speaker, and I, I also mentioned reparations. The National Sustainable Development Plan, if we're going to look at it for the, the six goals that are spelled out in it, it spells out six goals, which I just mentioned. And those six goals, Madam Speaker, are health care is one, education, environment, it's a very popular app, but Is this one? Yeah, those 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 six goals, Madam Speaker, are healthcare, education, the economy, infrastructure, good governance, and the environment. And we have to use the National Sustainable Development Plan to we have to, we have to use that plan, Madam Speaker, uh, follow the plan for the development of this territory over the next 15 years. Interestingly enough, Madam Speaker, in the plan, the reference to reparations is not just a ref simple reference. It speaks to regular lectures on reparations. It also speaks to um, the development and the establishment of a reparations committee This speaks to the fact that we are not in a vacuum here in the, in the Virgin Islands, Madam Speaker. This is a Caribbean-wide initiative. I think all the countries in the Caribbean has already gone, moved, towards, moved in that direction. And we in the Virgin Islands, being a part of the Caribbean, being a part of the diaspora, having the same history, need to be moving in concert. And that's why I think that it is as important for us to pay heed 
to that particular aspect, as we do pay heed to all the six goals that are, the other six goals that are listed, Madam Speaker. And that's why I also said that it would have been particularly interesting and helpful if mention had been made of the United Nations Charter for the Eradication of Colonialism by 2030. People tend more to gravitate and, understand, and pay heed to documents like this. Documents like this that are neutral. This is a neutral document. I consider it neutral. I consider it neutral and devoid of political influence and, and no particular personal interest in this document. That's why we commission studies like this. And that's why we make sure that pe persons who have been, have been commissioned to do work like this has a, a, an international perspective and a view of what's taking place in the world. So I don't want that particular fact to be lost on what we are about here with this National Sustainable Devel Development Plan. As the Premier stated, it is, not, it is not his administration's plan. It has a life that spans way beyond the life of this administration. So we ought to look at it from that standpoint as well. The immediate, the short term, the report covers a short term, a medium term, and a long term, long term priorities, the long term priorities. If I look at the short term priorities for each of these goals, Madam Speaker, in the, in the healthcare, goal number one is health. Uh, I always have this struggle about what should come first, whether it's education or health. Healthcare or education, which should get the most, uh, the first priority, which should get the most attention? Should it be healthcare or should it be education? And the only logical conclusion I've come up with that puts healthcare ahead of education is that if you're not healthy, education is useless. You wouldn't get it. You would never get education. So you got to be, you got to first be healthy, then you start thinking about, about education. But then again, someone could argue, how do you get health care if you're not educated? So I would say to that person, that's your problem. You figure out who comes first, the chicken or the egg. I'm just going for health care now. The first goal is health care, Madam Speaker. It says health care, uh, health and wellness, the Virgin Islands emphasizes healthy living and provides the structures for fulfilling lives. That's a national goal. The priorities under that is that says, strengthen the public health system to give more access to vulnerable groups, to work with partners on school feeding programs, work with partners on school feeding programs. That's a short-term goal. Where do we stand as far as that is concerned, school feeding programs? I don't, even, I don't even know that our secondary school offers a free lunch to every student in the school. I don't know that to be the case. And that is something, Madam Speaker, that I have been advocating since before I came here in this house. And I thought it was, it's, it's a given, Madam Speaker, it's a given. This is something that the, the kids in the United States, Virgin Islands have been having ever since I know them have to be going to school. They have a lunch program, free lunch. And people talk about money, Madam Speaker. How much money is gonna cost? How much money is gonna cost to feed kids? It's nothing compared to the losses that we sustain due to hunger. A hungry kid can't study, he can't concentrate. So you get some bright kids come out of the school, but that's only a percentage of what you could have had had you fed them, had you fed, had you fed, fed them all. So it's, it's a national it's a national um, priority 
that we should look into and make sure that we make we make sure that we get those um, school feeding programs up and running. That's why it's a short-term goal. It's short-term. Don't let us get past the first five years of this plan and that is not happening because you would have skipped it and moved on to the medium term and you'll never go back to doing something like that. Up upgrade the statistics on the impact of social safety and social protection systems. Statistics. My former colleague who used to sit here was a stickler for statistics. I've been a stickler for statistics. Every, every time they come to the House of Assembly, the, the, uh, the development planning unit, from the time they were development planning unit, I've been after them about statistics, statistics, statistics. You know, when I was uh, Minister for Communications and Works and I had my issues with airlift, when American Airlines, American Eagle decided that they were no longer coming to the territory, or they were reducing the number of flights they were bringing to the territory. I was faced with a situation where I had to get a Iliad to come in and end up paying them for uh, uh, revenue guarantee. But I couldn't find out from anyone, anywhere, if I put a plane on the tarmac in San Juan, how many people can I expect on a 10 o'clock flight? How many people can I expect on a 4 o'clock flight? No one could tell me. But neither the hotels, nor the statistical unit of government. How many persons are coming from Atlanta? How many persons are coming from uh, Kansas City? I can't tell you. But yet, if you are traveling to the Virgin Islands, you would have gotten this card, a ED. What's the ED card? To fill out. It's got like two, like four pages, two sheets, both sides. And you got to put all this stuff on. But no one captures the data. So statistics is here as a short-term goal, as a priority, Madam Speaker. We have to pay attention to these documents. And, and Madam Speaker, may I add that I've said, recently I've said it, and I've been saying it before, and I'm going to continue to say it in the past, I mean in the future. I'm going to continue to say it in the future. This House of Assembly, our legislature, is doing a disservice to the territory insofar as we are under-resourced, insofar as we are under-resourced. The first thing I would say also is that the House of Assembly is too small, the legislature is too small to serve the territory. You got a House of Assembly as it is right now with five ministers of 13 members. That's, that's, that's the um, executive. The executive is overwhelmed overworked but what about the rest of us where are the resources that we're going to need or that we do need in order to fulfill the obligations of the House of Assembly the House of Assembly has a, a priority madam speaker which is to hold the executive to account without resources how can you do that how can you possibly do that we have committees that don't meet. What's the use? I'm sitting here, Madam Speaker, and it's just me. I don't mean I don't have any other members in the opposition. I mean it's just me when I look back at it. There's nobody with me. Members are sitting there. It's just them. You look at any developed, you look at any developed legislature, Madam Speaker, they have staff, legal, accounting, administrative, and those people's job is to do research. Research 
and advice. We don't have that. Without that, the government public service cannot function properly. The government public service will never ever be any better than it is. Despite all the people that are complaining about the lack of service and the inefficiencies and all, it will never get any better than it is until concentration is paid on the, house, on the elected uh, parliament. Because our duty, Madam Speaker, is to act as their conscience. They do their jobs because each year they, pre they prepare their reports and they're tabled in this house. Those reports are not tabled in this house to sit on a shelf and gather dust. But that's exactly what happens to them because of the reason I just mentioned, there's no staff. We are supposed to scrutinize those reports. Our committees are supposed to do that. Our committees are supposed to call those public servants in and have them know their shortcomings and hold them accountable to it because if, not, if they don't live up to their, 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 their responsibilities, when the budget comes to the house, the monies they're asking for, they wouldn't get it, Madam Speaker. And there's proof to what I'm saying when I'm talking about this, the monies that they get. I see we went into the budget. We went into a budget, Madam Speaker, that was passed in this house and found $10 million to give the national health insurance. How do you pass a budget and go back into that same budget and find $10 million? It's because these, these officers, these public officers are not being held accountable. You asked for the money, you got it, but what happened? You never touched it. If we had the proper committees in our house, particularly a public accounting and, and um, what do you do with money? What do we do with money? When we appropriate an appropriating committee, Madam Speaker, public accounting and appropriating committee, to ensure that those monies are being used as appropriated, that $10 million will never be found in the budget. So, that's the point I'm making here, Madam Speaker. When, this, when, when, we ask, when the priorities in this is asking that uh, to, up, to upgrade the statistics on the impact of social safety and social protection system, no statistics. make healthy lifestyle a priority. Of course, of course, make healthy lifestyle a priority. If we did that, Madam Speaker, if we do this, all these funerals that we've been attending will be cut in half. So many of us, of the people who are dying, Madam Speaker, are dying from disease that are preventable. But if this report sits on the shelf for 15 years and go unnoticed, not only will, will, will the number of funerals that we are going to continue, it will increase, the number will increase. There's merit to this report, Madam Speaker, but if it's not used, it's useless. I heard the Premier say that the implementation mechanism are being put in place. I hope so. But like everything else, Madam Speaker, we've had every structure that's known to man had been, in, had been uh, established in this place. But they have a way of withering away, going by the wayside. Evidently, the architect seemingly dies after he designed it and with his death the whole structure falls apart so this administration will put the plan together for implementing it and another administration will come along and the implementation units 
the department head will start taking a member from that unit to, put, to do something else. And the next thing you know, the unit disappears. Ensure equal access to high quality health care and overall improvement in the quality of health care and service, services by all including persons with diabetes and the aged. All including persons with diabetes and the aged. You take a poll in this country, Madam Speaker, in this, in this Virgin Islands, take a poll. The number of persons that you would find, or the percentage of persons that you would find with diabetes, will be alarming. It will be alarming. And it's, it's just surreal. So why, why are we, we here talking about it as a short-term priority? This is 2023, we're talking about that as a short-term priority. It should never have existed in the first place. So what are we doing as I speak to reduce the contractions of this particular disease? What are we doing? You see people walking on the street with, the, uh, with a limp on a leg bandage, bandaged up. You never stop to find out from them what's, what's the cause of your ailment. Why is it that it's taking so long to heal? It's diabetes. I don't think there's any cure for, for aging so what you can do there is make life more comfortable for those who have aged. And speaking of which, Madam Speaker, speaking of which, I am not at all satisfied with the way our elderly are being taken care of in this territory. I am not at all satisfied. I come to this house, Madam Speaker, and I keep asking and begging and pleading for efforts to be made to at least, at least take us back to 10 years ago. I'm saying taking us back, we should be going forward. But we have regressed from where we were 10 years ago as far as the, the aged, is con the, the elderly is concerned and elderly care. I don't know if you can find a senior citizen program that's up and running right now in this territory. Two or three years ago, Madam Speaker, it was my community center was damaged. A year ago, it was damaged and repaired. Today, it's repaired and it's being occupied by other uh, entities other than who's, who was intended for. I have nothing against the fact that we are, we are, we are housing a school. I'm proud to be the house, housing the school of the, um, some, some of the students that are there now, which I'm sure that the minister is, is, is busy trying to find a permanent home for. And, and they are in no way, Madam Speaker, inconveniencing the seniors because it's a different section I'm talking about. The point I'm trying to make is that the fact that they're claiming that the building hasn't been turned over officially and all the rest of it, but others are occupying it. I passed there on a Saturday and I saw people sitting in that space, in, in, in the hall. I don't know what they were doing. I didn't go in to check to see what they were doing, but I know they were there using it. I spoke to the former minister, I spoke to the current minister about opening that, that um, senior citizen program. Madam Speaker, let me explain something to you about these seniors. These people have raised their children, they have worked in the community. Yes, they work because they got, they got, there's some social security that they get. I mean, it's, it's so small that 
if you open your purse, if you put it in your purse when you get it, you wouldn't, and open it, you wouldn't see it. But the, the point I'm making is that they couldn't get social security unless they worked. So they worked in the community for many, many, many years until they retired. After they retired, they did other things besides the regular job that they had. And then they got to the point where they just have to stay away from work. They raised their grandchildren who are now probably off the college or finished college and, and living their own lives. So all these seniors want, Madam Speaker, is a place to go during the day. Is that too much? When they have a place to go during the day, it's not just them. Or just, it's not just me or just you. It's us. The last, that's the least, that's the least. The people who brought you into this world, made you who you are, can ask of you. And we can't seem to see this. You know the same, Madam Speaker, what goes around comes around. If I see you treat Tom a certain way, when I grow up, I'm going to treat you the same way you treated Tom or even worse. Is, it, is this a society we're building? I, I, I can say not because we have a National Sustainable Development Plan that speaks for, for, for 15 years up to 2036 and they're asking us to do these things. So I could say that that's not the society we're trying to build. Unfortunately, this is a society that we end up with. And those of you who are laughing, not you in here, those of you who are laughing at me as I speak on behalf of the seniors or the elderly, I'll come you that come. If you're lucky, you'll get there one day. If you're lucky, you might just die now while you're laughing. Madam Speaker, in education, this is goal number two. Still on short-term goals. Education and learning. The Virgin Islands facilitates empowerment through innovative, creative, and vibrant learning environments. I would, I would imagine, Madam Speaker, as a national goal, the description that I just read for education, it says, education and learning. The Virgin Islands facilitates empowerment through innovative, creative, and vibrant learning environments. I would imagine, Madam Speaker, that when the committee who put this report together did their study, they have consulted the educators and this description that I just read, I feel in my mind, is what the educators really, really want. This is what they see their role as, do, as, as doing, as being. And for the priorities on education, it says establish and implement, and establish the implementation framework for the National Sustainable Development Plan. to establish the implementation framework. And that's exactly what I was talking about, Madam Speaker. Implementation. So this is the Department of Education and the Ministry of Education's responsibility to establish the implementation framework for the National Sustainable Development Plan. So whatever the National Sustainable Development Plan is asking for, for education, in the field of education over the next 15 years, it becomes the responsibility of the, the education department and ministry to establish that framework. And I would imagine, Madam Speaker, the only thing that can come between the Ministry of Education and develop, delivering on this plan 
will be resources, economic, financial resources. And that's something I think that the minister will be working towards each year to uh, fulfilling. It says um, also focus on identity building by ensuring that the history, national symbols, and territorial song are entrenched at all levels of the education system. It says, strengthen youth entrepreneurship, mentoring, and internship programs. The strengthen youth entrepreneurship, mentoring, and internship programs. So there you have it. A few minutes ago, I was advocating for the seniors. Now it's the turn for the youth. Or oh, youth, Madam Speaker, it's the law. It's the law that education is mandatory for children up, at, up to, I think, 15 years. Education is mandatory. It's the law. So we do make sure that we provide for the youth. I was talking about the school lunch program as well. I advocate for the youth just the same as I do for the seniors. The difference is that the advocacy for the youth is enshrined in law. But when it comes to the seniors, you can abandon them without reprisals. And unfortunately, that is exactly what happens. So it leaves me to come here and talk about it, to make sure that my colleagues, who are responsible for taking care of them, doesn't forget that they have a responsibility. So it's not, it's, it's not being done at the expense of the youth. It's being done to make sure that we do right by our citizens. Integrate sports as a tested program at all levels and improve all sporting facilities. Huh. <laughs> Let me read that one again. It says integrate sports as a testing program, tested program at all levels and improve all sporting facilities. Well, that's a joke. It is not a joke going forward, but it's a joke as we stand right now. I, I want to make sure that everyone understands that this is in the National Sustainable Development Plan. Short term. This is not long term. So don't tell me that you're going to wait till 2035 to start working on these things. This is short term. Improve sporting facilities? Well, where do you want me to start? I always say that election is coming up. Elections are coming up. And I'm going to hear people talking about the basketball court. I'm going to fix the basketball court. I'm going to build the bleachers and, and, and make sure the lighting is given, put lighting. Do they know that the basketball court was top notch at one point? It had the best lighting that, 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 that could possibly be. They had bleachers, but where are they? Where are they? The word, the operative word in this plan is sustainable. So we keep reinventing the wheel. We keep spinning the same top in the same mud and the same results. We have to be more innovative. We have to be more creative. We have to be more realistic. I remember, Madam Speaker, there are some things you don't forget, and for good reasons. Bellevue, of all places, it was like a diamond in the rough. You go to Bellevue, and they have this basketball gymnasium. It was nothing more than a warehouse converted into a, a gymnasium, a basketball gymnasium. But you know what was unique about that, Madam Speaker? It was indoors. It was indoors. And it meant that 
men of uh, many, men, many things, but more importantly, Madam Speaker, it meant that, 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 that young people can play basketball 24-7 around the clock, nights, days, despite the weather condition outside outdoors, rain, doesn't matter, they can do it. And they produce, I can say that, they produce the best basketball players that the territory had. Why? Because of access to facility, good facility. Instead of us as a territory emulating that facility and produce more of such basketball facility in the territory, we allowed for Hurricane Irma to destroy that facility and not rebuild it. So instead of having one such facility in the territory, there is no such facility in the territory. If you want, you could point fingers to Virgin Garda and say that we have a, a covered facility, not enclosed. And it wasn't an expensive proposition. It was cheaper to have that facility than it is to have the ones outdoors because with the ones outdoors, you got to worry about trimming the grass, keeping the cattle off the, off the, the top, the, the court, and cleaning that up. The weather condition destroys the bleachers and all the rest of it. We have to start thinking more strategic, Madam Speaker. And if, if, you go, if you go to a campaign rally and you don't hear people with, with strategic thoughts, you know you're just heading down the same rabbit hole that everyone else is in. Work with the diaspora to create skills bank. Work with the diaspora to create skills bank. I think the Virgin Islands, Madam Speaker, has gotten spoiled into the, into the, the, the idea, uh, into the fact that they can rely on the rest of the Caribbean for their skills. So harnessing our own skills has, has become less of a priority. We lose our own talents to the United States mostly. But that talent that we lose to the United States is which could, could be retrievable if we did the right thing. When all students leave here to go off to study, we should ensure that they come back. Not with, not with a stick, Madam Speaker. Not with a stick, but with a carrot. We spend millions of dollars educating our students. And we just said to them, you must come back home because you're on scholarship. But come back home has to have some reality to it, Madam Speaker. You're asking me to come back home, and, it, and when I get here, more times than none, you have to sit for six months and can't even find a job. And if you do find a job, the the pressures and the scrutiny that you have to go through, Madam Speaker, is, is, is so not worth it. You're almost telling these people that you want them to go back. You want them, you want them to leave. And that's exactly what happens. So when we talk, when we talk about work with the diaspora to create skills bank. The wording in this makes it okay. Makes seems to me seems to suggest that what we're doing is not is not wrong. We could continue to do it because we're working with the diaspora. But we need to first start working with ourselves to create the skills bank. The economy, Madam Speaker, that's goal number three says the economy. The Virgin Islands has a prosperous, vibrant, and thriving internationally competitive economy. Prosperous, vibrant, and thriving internationally competitive economy. I believe 
I believe the AG might be the best person to speak to this with an understanding as to how our financial services, how international it is. We have, of course, we have some maybe 450 to 500,000 companies registered on the books. And those are, in, those are really overwhelming majority of, of international companies. So maybe that's what they're talking about, thriving internationally competitive economy. I, ha I am not under any illusion, Madam Speaker, that yes, our name is big internationally for the service we render. We are the best at what we do. And I, I expect us to continue that way for a long time. But we cannot take it for granted and sit on our laurels, Madam Speaker, because if somewhere in here it is not speaking to, not necessarily totally diversity, diversifying the economy, but naturally maximizing what we have, then we're not doing anything. In maximizing what we have, let's see what they talk about when they say um, the, the priorities for this for the economy. It says, convene a meeting with the private sector and government priorities and the linkage with corporate, social, and economic responsibilities. Convene a meeting with the private sector and government priorities and the linkage with corporate, social, and economic responsibilities. Well, this is something that the private, the private sector and all public sector will be convening and con, uh, are communicating on. It says, develop inventory list of government assets, marine, land, ports, tourism, fishing, agricultural, building, vehicles. I would imagine, Madam Speaker, that if this was not, if this, if, this did, if this existed, it would not show up here as a priority. And the question I would have, Madam Speaker, is we don't have an inventory as a government of our assets. We don't know what our marine assets are. Lands, ports, tourism, fishing, agricultural, building, and vehicles. If it existed, we wouldn't be asking for it, Madam Speaker. We would have talked about further development, but we simply, we, we outright asking for the list. That's unacceptable, Madam Speaker. It falls in the same category as I was talking about earlier when I asked, talk about statistics, the absence of statistics. It says also upgrade the digital space through negotiations of new contracts with service providers. Hmm. Upgrade capacity building and negotiations between uh, business law and protocol. Upgrading and strengthening of an integrated statistical system that provides time-sensitive feedback to citizens and to the business community. I think I touched on that already, Madam Speaker, how unacceptable it is to, to be in the position that we are in. And that's even, that's even more immediate than a short-term goal, Madam Speaker, getting those things together. How do we be standing here today in, in 2023 talking about statistics and the shortcomings of our government ability to furnish those statistics, to, further, to create the statistics and then to, to, to furnish them? Num goal number four, infrastructure. The Virgin Islands 
emphasizes reliance building and access to sustainable services. The priorities are invest in the upgrading of pedestrian walkways and facilities that is inclusive, taking into consideration persons with mobility constraints and the aged. Persons with mobility constraints, pedestrian walkways, facilities that is inclusive, mobility constraints. We are so out of touch with the needs of people who are somewhat disabled or anywhere disabled with our public facilities, Madam Speaker. And I spoke about accommodating the age already. When you go to any parking lot, public or private parking lot, there should be certain numbers of parking spaces for, for people who are, are, are physically challenged. That should, that should be the law. It should be painted out. And when these people, or anyone, when they go into these parking lots, there should not be a vehicle parked behind them in the, in the, in the service lane in the parking lot. These are all responsibilities of the government. And when I say government, I'm talking, it, you know, when I say government, I don't want the members in this house to start looking around them. I want them to look at themselves. It's us. It's our responsibility to make sure that these things happen. And if you go into a parking lot, when you go into right where parking lot, minister, and you see that there are no, well, I wouldn't single out right where, but if you go into any parking lot and you see there are no parking spaces for the handicap, you're supposed to go back to your office and ensure that the laws are updated if they're not provided for, to make sure that there are parking spaces and not certain number. The, ratio is, the ratios are there. They already determined what the ratio should be to have those things painted. walkways, pedestrian walkways. Those are the responsibility of our government. Enforce the safety regulations, including the wearing of helmets and swerving between vehicles for bikers. Crossing at zebra crossing for pedestrian, drinking and driving, Vehicle maintenance, the wearing of seat belts and observing speed limits for motor vehicles and buses. I'm sure the laws are there for those, and that's a matter for the law enforcement agencies. So there's something in here not just for uh, public servants. There's something in here for law enforcement as well. And there are things in here for the regular citizen, how we should conduct, how they should conduct themselves. Commence and complete the upgrading of roads. This is short term. Commence and complete the upgrading of roads. How, how, do, you, how do I address this particular is, issue? How do we address this particular issue? Commence and complete the upgrading of roads. I think we should first start with maintenance, maintenance of the roads, maintenance of our facilities. If you got a sidewalk, Madam Speaker, and you, could, you see grass growing up in the sidewalk, when it first starts, it's a little blade of grass that comes through the sidewalk. And if you don't make sure that you get rid of that blade of grass, the next time you see it, it'll be a bunch of grass. Now, a blade of grass takes a millimeter to grow through, but a bunch of grass will take several inches to grow through. So what that is doing is deteriorating the sidewalk. So if we don't maintain these facilities, Madam Speaker, we're just moving backwards. 
it costs more to rebuild it than it costs to, re to maintain it. But we don't see that. And it's a fact. And that's exactly what this, this sustainable development plan is calling for. It says commence the upgrading of schools. Well, that's such an uphill climb. Commence the upgrading of schools. I'm not going to get into that. There's one thing I didn't see in education, which I would mention here, Madam Speaker, is that some years back, this, school, this, this, this territory was hot on, and high on uh, getting accreditation for our high school. And we were close. And I was very surprised that when this administration took over, that they didn't pursue it because this is something that was taking place between 2007 and 2011, and they were close. It, was, it, was, it, it preceded the college. It was ahead of the college. And when the succeeding administration came in from 2011 to 2019, that went to sleep. And I thought that this administration would have taken up the mantle and got the, gotten the high school accredited but that was not the case. And I think that they should move towards doing that. It makes life a whole lot less difficult for, for students who travel abroad. Goal number five, good governance, accountable, accountable government and citizens participation. The priorities there are establish and promote the Constitutional Review Commission and commence public education on same. Well, I think that, that that is very much under control. It's, it's moving along, Madam Speaker. The Constitutional Review Commission is doing their work. Today is February 2nd, so two days ago, they have co concluded their public consultation and when the report started out, I think they had uh, two, two years to, to finish it and get the report in to government. I'll say this, Madam Speaker, about that Constitutional Review Commission. I think this one is our tent. Uh, some, somebody correct me if I'm off there. So we have plenty of track records, plenty of examples to follow. And I think that this commission has done so far, followed through in a manner that I, I, I find to be commendable. And it seems to me as if with, with the exception, Mr. Premier, of making the facilities available to them, their secretariat, they need it, so that they can function in a way that they expect to, or we expect them to, so they can get their report together and get it out. I think that they had all the consultations that they, except I don't think they went to the United States Virgin Islands. If that's the case, that's a misfortune, Madam Speaker, because we have, in the United States Virgin Islands, we have a, a strong interest in what takes place here in, in, the, in the Virgin Islands. And a constitution without their input would have a lot of explaining to do. But I think it's, it's very fitting to have it placed here in the, in the, the National Sustainable Development Plan for as part of our goals. Promote and report on the budget with a view to receiving feedback from citizens. Promote and report on the budget with a view to receiving feedback from citizens. I don't particularly know how that works or how to go about doing that but that's what the report is asking, or says should be done. Report on target sets in the budgets. If we had this 
um, Public Accounting and Appropriation Committee, which goes through the budget as it happens. Maybe you can be able to get reports from this house, from that committee, on how the monies are being spent. And if they're being spent in a timely manner, and any comments that they may have and criticisms. But again, we don't have that. Public sector reform and concentrates, that concentrates on coordination, statistics, and integration. Mapping of the SDGs to departmental policies. Strategic development goals to departmental policies. And the sixth and final goal, Madam Speaker, is the environment. The Virgin Islands embraces environmental sustainability for sustained islands development. And the priorities are, short term priorities, establish a negotiation team on climate financing. Madam Speaker, with the member for the 9th District and myself attending, um, attended a meeting by the CPA in New York, and it, it dealt with climate change. And Madam Speaker, if you talk to the average man on the street about climate change, he will never have an appreciation for the reality and the devastation that is taking place worldwide as a result of climate change. So as far-fetched and, and as unnecessary things like this may seem, it's to the contrary. Establish a negotiation team on climate financing. The rest of the world, the developed world, and those independent countries that has the opportunity to sit in the United Nations and on all the various national and international forums to discuss matters like these are first and foremost concentrating on ways in which to finance the mitigation of the devastation of climate change. And, and the developed countries are putting up big money, Madam Speaker, that can, that can benefit small territories like ours. Because despite the fact that we have almost zero, almost zero uh, contribution to the changes in the climate, we are impacted more than zero percent. The impact that we sustain, Madam Speaker, is far greater than our contribution to the problem. So we can benefit from, sometimes it's not always the actual financial contribution that you receive, but the education you can gather from these forums, from being a part of these things, Madam Speaker, it's invaluable. Approve the blue economy strategy. Blue economy strategy. I'll let my good friend from the 8th district explain what the blue economy strategy is. <laughs> Put him on the spot. I'm tired. I got to sit down now. <laughs> Promote the establishment of youth environmental groups on all the islands. Youth environmental groups on all the islands. That's a good thing. Get, get, the kid, get the young people involved in things like the environment. Something that's going to be around for, the, for, for their entire lives. Show them how to protect the environment, how to be good custodians of the environment, and, and simple things like dropping a wrapper on the, on the street. 
not dropping the wrapper on the street is protecting the environment, but dropping, dropping the wrapper is, is, is a devastation to, uh, contributes to the devastation of the, the uh, environment. Develop an awareness of corporate social responsibility for the environment with an award for groups and businesses which assist in developing climate change technology. Sounds good. Develop a policy on engagement with partners on the sargassum as it relates to use and financing. Sargassum is a nuisance, Madam Speaker. And it, it's something that, it's not a, that it's something that, that just started. They've been around for all my life. But of late, Madam Speaker, they seem to be more abundant. I don't know if it's because our marine sector has been developed to the point where in the past it would just come in and disappear within the, between the mangroves and you didn't, didn't realize it was there, to now where we have our shorelines all bulkheaded and it comes and it just backs up. If, if, road, if road Harbor was all mangroves, Madam Speaker, the sargassum would come in and you and I would not pay attention to it because first of all, you wouldn't see it because it would be behind the mangroves and a good portion of it would be with, be, between the mangroves. The only thing that would bother us is, this, is this, the smell. But now the, the sargassum is also a hazard to the, the ferries and all the different boats that sail in the water. So we have to find ways to coexist with it. Since we, haven't already, since we haven't already determined uh, our use for it. Launch an innovative comp competition for youth in the area of environmental sustainability. That is something that can, be, get, that can get started within the schools, Madam Speaker. And I think that our curriculum this is speaking to developing a curriculum to include such things. So Madam Speaker, I, I think that there's a lot of good things in this, this plan. And all we need to do, Madam Speaker, is try our level best. This administration has already stated that the implementation of it is being set up. The next administration has to now start looking at putting that implementation plan to work through using the implementation unit to do what has to be done. With that said, Madam Speaker, I think that the report is off to a good start as far as its exposure is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Leader of the Opposition. I now call on the Deputy Speaker, Honorable Neville Smith. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I don't think whatever I have to say might, might really complement this document the way that it needs to be complemented, given the time that, you know, we're given to really come and debate this document. Because it's a very, very good document, what I've read so far, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I would like to thank the people in the committee who is, they went beyond and above to gather the information that we have here in front of us today. Um, they did a very intensive research on a lot of the things that we are seeing here, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Premier made a statement earlier by saying that this will not be left on the shelf. And Madam Speaker, I hope it will not be left on the shelf. It's too much and too long, too much time we, we get good documents and good information from people and good ideas and plans and they're left behind, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if you plant a seed and you don't want it, it will not grow. Today, 
a seed is being planted here. And we have to make sure that this seed grow. It's not up to us here as leaders, but up to the entire Virgin Islands to make sure this happens, Madam Speaker. Too long we have been doing the wrong. We have not been planning ahead of time. We have not been planning at all. We have not. We come here every time we have election, every four years you come with a plan. That is not a plan. We have to make sure, put things in place that whoever come after, you have to follow that plan. It's the people who are speaking, not just as leaders, Madam Speaker. When you go through this, this plan that we have here, the development plan, it outlines every single section and sectors that we have not been paying attention to. We are coming here and we are saying this and we are saying that. But what is the plan? Now that we have a plan, we have to make it go forward. And I have a challenge with that because a lot of times we come here, I say we make laws, but when it comes to the actual enforcement of the laws, it does not go through. So my question today, Madam Speaker, and I ask my honorable comments as well, and my colleagues, what are we going to do to make sure that this is something that we could get done? What are we going to put in place that after the next general election, let's say the administration change, that this will happen? We have to be serious with what we are saying, what we want to, what we want to do. We have to put things in place. We may lose an election, but we might win a country. It can't be about us when the time comes to the pool. It can't be about us. It got to be about the people. And this is about the people. When we put things in, like this in place, it's carry the country forward. Madam Speaker, every time we have a general election, we go backward. That's how I look at it. Because every time a new administration gets in, they change the plan. How can we progress? You're taking one step back forward, two step backward. Three step forward, five backward. We have to be serious about how or where we want to see this country go, Madam Speaker. And I think today we have a roadmap that we can use. We have to decide what our priorities really are. What are our priorities? What are the people priorities, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, I, I heard my honorable colleague, opposition leader, talk about data. Again, I came to this house and I talked about us having information that we could use and continue to use data. We have to start st storing these things, Madam Speaker. How can you build on something if you don't know what you have? We have to take this, this serious. And it, it's, not about, it's not about us, Madam Speaker. It's not. Madam Speaker, our vision, our vision, future, our voices are heard in this document. Because the, the people and the group who went out to get this information, they went and they speak to everyone. If somebody gets it behind, I'm surprised because they, they were out, they were out there. They went all over gathering information, speaking to people. The people have spoken. We cannot continue going on the same road. We have to make decisions. And some of the decisions we make, some people ain't gonna like. But we have to make decisions. That's, that's what leaders do. They make decisions. Ain't everybody going to like you. And it can't be about being re-elected. If you do your job, you will be elected. We have to change the way that we think, the way that we behave, Madam Speaker. And like I said, Madam Speaker, I don't think I could do this document. <laughs> all the justice it deserves, because I really would have liked to sit down and 
pick out stuff out of this document because there's so many good things in it. Honorable Fraser mentioned some of them. There's a lot of good things in it. But again, I, I say, how will we implement it? That's my, that's my, this, this is what bothered me. How? What are we going to do to put in place to make sure that this happens? Because too much time we come here, we put things and it don't happen. So I think that we have to make sure that we find a way that this works. We cannot sit on and wait for nobody to make it work. We have to make it work. And we as a people, I talk about everybody in Virgin Islands. We have to make this work. Stop pointing fingers and blaming people. We is our own problem. That's what's going on here. We is our own problem. We cannot work together. We don't want to work together. The only way we can fix this country is if we work together. And we have a document now that we can work with. We just have to work together, Madam Speaker. The buck has to stop now. We can't wait for election to come every time to somebody saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Because that's all we're doing. Everybody coming with their plan. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. Is the election finish? What happens? There's none to hold us accountable for what we say we're going to do. Ain't nothing there. I go come and promise you the wall. But we're not getting that to do different. Because there's nothing there to hold us to what we say. The view put this in plan that everybody, when we come in here, that we have a, a plan for five, ten years, and this is the stage we have to go. We have, we have the immediate plan, you have the, the minimum, you have the, the long term, and you put that in place. We have, a st we have steps to climb. We have a ladder to climb. And that's what we need to do. We can't achieve everything one time. But if we put a plan in place, step by step, we could get there. And you have to hold us accountable for it. Madam Speaker, I will not stay long because I think Honorable Fraser and the Premier said so much. But I just want to rise to say support this document. Do whatever it takes to see how we could get this implemented and be followed, not just put on the shelf. This is not something to be left on the shelf. And again, I would like to thank the members, who is the, the group who went out and do all the research and put this together, Madam Speaker, because with this, I think we can see our way forward. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize the member for the 4th District, Honorable Mark Vantapool. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, I appreciate the opportunity to address the House and the public on this very important document. I, I, I appreciate the Premier's effort to get it on the agenda and get it uh, moving in the public. And therefore, it was a bit rushed today to come to the House with us, without us having a chance to really study it. Um, it was the first time in a long time I had to get into some what you call speed reading that I haven't done for a while. But I got through some of it and I would like to make my contribution, hopefully not too long, I'm going to do my best to go through it. I, I wish I had markers to place in my book here that I'm going to read from and, and address, if I may be allowed to address, some of the reading Madam speaker because it's important. Um, but so you might have to bear with me a little bit when I'm trying to find my pages that I wish to refer to because there's some very important matters in this document, Madam Speaker, as other members have, have indicated, and I want to try to highlight some of it, um, if, if only to alert the public that they should study this document when it gets into the public hands and debate it and discuss it as an important document for the country moving forward. Uh, it, in, in, my, in my opening statement, I would say that I want to really commend those led by Dr. June uh, and, and the others who have done a very good job in presenting it and researching it, and for the public who have made their contributions over the many months 
to bring this document to fruition. If I, if I make the comparison, Madam Speaker, this document is no more than a business plan for the territory from now to 2036. Every business like, us, like my, my own and others have to have a regular business plan to look at and revise and update it as we go along. And certainly I'm sure this document is going to be updatable in the future, but as a, a, a blueprint, a, a guideline for going forward over the next several years, it certainly gives us the opportunity to look at where we are going, where we should be going, how we should get there, and what might be the best options for getting there. There is even, and I'm, I'm going to come to it when I, get, when I come a little later, there's even mentioned in here a SWOT analysis of, uh, of strengths, as, as is done in a business plan, of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and, uh, and the, 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 um, the team meaning um, the threats that are there in, in, in the analysis. So that's a very important one that I've seen in there. I'm going to highlight some of it because it's important to understand as a country that ultimately it's almost like a business going forward to see what is best to enrich the people of the territory in, in, as we go along. It might not be always facts and, and figures, but it certainly is a, a, a blueprint, a guideline uh, uh, as to where we should be going as a territory. So this document, Madam Speaker, that we have here, and I, I raise it because it's important that everyone who in the territory can get a, a hand on it can be able to see it. I ask the, the, the speaker for a hard copy because I like to put the hard copy of this on my shelf, not just in the electronic form, but I'd like to have it so that I can always uh, refer to it. And, and, and one day when it's all digital stories, of our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, they will go to the, the, digital, the digital library, but I still like to have my hard copy at this time to look at. And, and like my brother, uh, Pastor C. Oliver Hodge would do when he reads a book, you will see I have a lot of writing in, writings in it, big and broad, for where I want to, to be paying attention to. And if you read through my book, you will, you will be, you will grab the, it will grab your attention with those big writings and underlinings that I normally would do when I'm reading through, and I try to do that in the last hour uh, of the document, not giving the justice and really digging into it, Madam Speaker. So I, I would be referring to a number of sections in here. Uh, the, na the name of this document as an introduction is Vision 2036, Building a Sustainable British Virgin Island. Vision 2036, Building a Sustainable Virgin Islands. Important to say, that it's a vision for, 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 from now to 2036, and 2036 sounds a very long time away. We're in 2023, that's 13 years from today. And uh, I, I, like, I like when people think that far ahead, because you, you might think it's not, gonna, it's not right around the corner. 2011, when I was re-elected uh, after a, a short stint of, of, um, of, 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 of uh, sabbatical, uh, in 2011 to now, it's almost 13 years ago. And if you understand it in that context, we will understand that 13 years or 15 years is not that far away. So you must lay down our foundation, lay down our plans, and move towards achieving those. In no business, in no country, in no place you ever achieve everything. But if you make that attempt to lay down what you are trying to achieve, and you aim at getting there, then you will get there. The challenge, as the Honorable Deputy Speaker um, highlighted uh, a little while ago, is that unlike a business that is owned by someone or some group that is continuous, governments tend to fall into the trap of changing every four years, and therefore the business plan changes. The, I think the, 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 the object of this, of this exercise that is none, or, or what you may call, bipartisan where um, uh, we all are buying into it is that we hope that governments who may come and governments who may go will adopt to at least the basic principles of this document over the next 13 years or 15 years or whatever it might be. So that we can use this as the basis since the opposition was involved, the government was involved, the people were involved especially, that we can adopt this document as a guide it is not going to be always exactly what it says, but let it be a guide for the six major tenants that are highlighted 
in this document, the six major tenants. And Madam Speaker, and, and those six major tenants are important for us to, to, to follow in understanding where we are going and what we are trying to achieve here in, in, this, in, the, in, the, in this document, Madam Speaker. So I hope we can, we, can, we can adopt it. We can agree that it becomes the principal direction that the country wants to go and that every cabinet in the future that may be called upon to follow these guidelines, it may be called upon. And I wish sometimes, Madam Speaker, that some of these, these documents that we create can be probably in, even enshrined in some way or another in the Constitution that, 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 that governments that come and the governments that go will be, will be called upon to, 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 follow, to follow these guidelines. So I want to make sure that we can, we can understand it from that context of the importance of this document that it may be possibly can be referred to in the new Constitution to be a document that can be followed and should be followed by, 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 by all governments. So we are hoping that we can, we can achieve this, Madam Speaker, in, 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 in drawing attention to the importance of this document, building a sustainable Virgin Islands, Madam Speaker. So if I may, Madam Speaker, delve in, not to all of it, but a few important aspects of it after I pass the page of the Premier and his good-looking picture and the um, Honorable Opposition, his good-looking picture also, and get into a bit more of the document, we will, we will realize that uh, uh, we, like the document said, and sometimes we need to appreciate who we really are in, 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 in the executive summary and so on, right? We must realize who we really are, and it speaks, it speaks of us as 60, 60 uniquely beautiful islands, caves, and rocks. 60 uniquely beautiful islands, caves, and rocks. A, a wonderful description, a beautiful description of the Virgin Islands. A, 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 perhaps a poetic description, as, as the illustrious students might call it, of the Virgin Islands, but one which really captures who we really are from a, from a beauty and environmental standpoint that that, that, that makes us who we really are in that sense. And if we can be proud of it, we will, we will try to sustain our beautiful, uniquely beautiful islands, keys, and rocks, if we, if, if we can accept and be so proud of our beautiful islands here. I had, I had some visitors here two weeks ago who I took a day off and decided to uh, charter, charter a boat and take them around the, around the islands, especially on the, the Virgin Gorda side and up, up to the North Song and so on. And it was amazing how those visitors said their trip that was on a cruise for seven days, this was the greatest highlight of their cruise. They had never enjoyed a place so beautiful as the Virgin Islands, the British Virgin Islands. And I, I felt proud, Madam Speaker, that I spent a few pennies to give them such a tour that they came off the tour and wrote me back and said this was the absolute highlight of the tour on that cruise. And Madam Speaker, we sometimes take it for granted, not realizing how beautiful our Virgin Islands are. We must continue to be proud of our beautiful Virgin Islands. Sustainable, a word that is very, very crucial. A word that, that engenders uh, uh, what we need to do to be around and live and, and, and survive and, and grow and, 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 and be, 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 be um, I don't know what the word I want to get there, but be available to our youths and the, and the future sustaining for the future of our, of our people here in the Virgin Islands in the long run for the sustainability of the territory. Not just 13 years, Madam Speaker, from now to 2036, but how can we survive and sustain our territory for generations to come? And in, in, in the past, in the 60s and the 50s, someone may have said, how can this 
sustain uh, 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 and, and be able to have the Virgin Islands sustained for generations to come, our generations to come. And we thank them for that. They fought for it. The 49 March, the, 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 the various times when they, 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 they took steps to, 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 to make sure our Virgin Islands was, was not just a push aside or bird sanctuary or some, they pushed to make sure that our Virgin Islands could be sustained for future generations. And hence we are here. Hence we are here today to enjoy the benefits of sustainability that our forefathers make sure they were there. They may not have written it, they may not have written it, Madam Speaker, in those flowery terms, sustainability and all those, those big terms. But they did everything to make sure that the Virgin Islands could survive and be sustained for our generation. This document, therefore, uh, puts down what should be our generation right now, our generation responsibility, our generation's uh, uh, commitment, our generation's uh, uh, business plan, our generation's thoughts and ideas that we should enshrine in our, in, in, in our plans to make sure the Virgin Islands is sustained for future generations. And if you don't do that, Madam Speaker, we have not carried out our duty as a people. I'm not talking about just as a members in the House of Assembly. I'm talking about our duty as a people to make sure that the Virgin Islands can be sustained for generations to come. So don't, let's not just put this document as a push aside and, and another exercise as, as one good member said or several members said. Let's, and as the Premier mentioned in his opening statement, let's make sure we can use this document to be enshrined in our, in our future planning for the good of the future generations of the Virgin Islands, Madam Speaker. So let's, let's make sure that, as chapter one says, it's a context for our vision for sustainable development. That's the context of it. And they go ahead and state various matters for the geography of us, the legal system, and, and so on, Madam Speaker. So it's, it, it, it is important. And it's important, Madam Speaker, to recognize that over the many years, this country has grown and, Madam Speaker, we want to make sure that people don't use certain things that have occurred in the last short, this, uh, the, the, the last period of time in the last two years or three years, or the last year even, Madam Speaker, to, to, to cloud what this country have accomplished over the last many years based on the sustainable uh, foundation that was laid down by your forefathers, Madam Speaker. And, and in this document, it probably goes back further. But Madam Speaker, in, 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 in prior to 2010, this country's GDP, the gross domestic product, the amount of money that turned around in this country, in, 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 in layman's terms, the gross domestic product, the amount of money that was turned around in this country was way below uh, 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 700 million or, or even 500 million. But in 2016, it rose to $1.4 billion. I like to tell people we have moved from the, from the M's as a country. We used to be in the thousands. Uh, the, the Honorable um, uh, uh, Wheatley, uh, uh, Dr. Wheatley, and his many years ago, bragged about the thousand that he, he saved and that he put aside. Maybe it was just over a million, many years ago. I, I forget the figure, no, one point something million dollars that he was bragging about. But he moved from the M's, went to hundreds of M's, and now, Madam Speaker, people must be, understand that this country is a small country with a small population, with a small geographic size, have moved to the B's. We are in the B's. We are a billion dollar company, a billion dollar uh, country, Madam Speaker. For a small society, a small co country, a country that was, we, we, had, we, were, we had donkeys and horses and mules and, and cows and, 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 and sweet potato and, 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 and tanyas up on the hill many years ago, and we have now moved to a, con a country that is producing $1.4 billion in 2016, Madam Speaker, in our gross domestic product. That you must be proud of. That you must be proud of. And while we, while, while, while we retrogress a bit because of certain uh, unavoidable situations of the hurricanes of 2017 and the pandemics of 2020 and 2021, we must begin to, 
to lay the foundation, as this is suggesting, to be able to have a sustainable development that keeps growing for the future generation of the country. And the 1.4 billion or whatever it might come to must translate to better living for the people of the country, must translate to a better life for the people of the country, must, must translate to better health, as is stated in this document. And I won't go into the details of it, but um, we must translate to better health, a better education, Madam Speaker, a better life. Madam Speaker, do you know that in this document it states that, and, and, and there was a document that was made public in the past by the United Nations who came to study us. There were 21% of the people in the Virgin Islands under the poverty line. 21%? Madam Speaker, that's nearly a quarter of the people living in the Virgin Islands are considered to be poor by United Nations standards. That needs to sink in. We go around thinking that we are such great and wonderful people and everything is fine with everybody, but not realizing that you walk into the villages and you walk into the houses and you walk into the little people who have four children in the house and a, one, and, and a lady who's trying to, to survive, to, to feed them and to take care of them and not realizing how, how poverty is affecting that family. When I speak, I don't know about, 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 about you, but I have had to do that in my, in my community. I have had to do that in my community. You go into the, the inner, 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 inner sanctums, if I put it that way, of the districts and realize that there are people in there who are poor, who are struggling to survive, whose electricity get cut off on Friday, and unless they can find a representative to help them get it back on before Monday, they sleep in a house without electricity for the weekend. Mr. Speaker, these are, these are facts, daily facts that people face here in the territory, and it's, writ it's written in here, Madam Speaker. 21% according to the report that was given, and I, and I will read it here, Madam Speaker, despite the prosperity of the country. There are still households living in poverty. Of those who reported in 2010, this is 2010, 29% reported their gross monthly income as being in the bottom two of six income uh, levels with income below $1,400 a month. At that time, Madam Speaker, there were some people whose income was $700 a month with children to, to support in their houses. The average monthly income is, is estimated at $3,500 based on the 2010 census, the average. The Virgin Islands most re recently completed country Country Poverty Assessment 2000, in 2003 found that 21% of the population were considered poor and 29% of children from 0 to 17 were considered poor in the Virgin Islands. Now, when we say that, people say, don't talk them thing, man. Let me ain't true. In, in, in the facts. Madam Speaker, if, if you're a representative of a district or even at large and you go inside of your districts in some areas that you, you would think. It, it, uh, uh, the, the, the reason why you don't really see it, Madam Speaker, is our people are so proud. They don't like people to know their condition. So they, they walk around with their head high and looking, 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 looking satisfied and happy. And then when they go in the house, they have to deal with the issues that face them on a daily basis. And the representative is the one who might have to go in there and, and deal with it and face it. I, I, the member for the, for the six will tell you. Other members will tell you. You have to face these issues. So our job is to make sure that we can get people to improve their lives. When you go to be elected for four years, your job is to make sure that where, where you met people in the, in the growth of their life should not be the same place you left them. You should have lifted their life standard. You should have helped them to get out of poverty, helped them to get more education, that may help them to get out of poverty, help them, help them to, to get better jobs, help them to, 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 to learn more trades, help them to move along in, 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 in life in a better way so that your four years that you started, at the end of that four years, you want to make sure that you can proudly say that you help your people to move along and have a better standard of living, sustainable development. That is what we're talking about. That is what I want to bring this document down to. I don't want this document to be just a, a, a big word and a big statement and a big story like that that's going to sit on the shelf. This is about sustaining 
and making the standard of living for the people of the Virgin Islands better. Yes, Madam Speaker, you may hear us talking, and I'm going to speak about it forever, whether I'm in this house or not. We have to fix our roads. The standard of living for the people of the Virgin Islands shouldn't be one way. We've got to drive on these kinds of roads forever. And you may put it to me that I was a minister for roads and I didn't fix them. Fine. But let's don't let it make an excuse for not fixing them. Let's fix them. You have put it to me, Madam Speaker, that we don't have the money to build the roads. Fine. But let's make a sustainable development plan to plan for these roads, not over, over four years. No government can fix the roads in the territory over four years. But plan it over 10 or 15 or 20 year period, properly planned, properly developed, properly studied, properly engineered, and move a plan to start developing the roads in a, in, a, in a systematic way, in a phased way, over 20 or 25 years. And by the end of 25 years, we might have a sustainable development roads that can, in the territory that people can be proud of. We've gone to other countries, poorer countries than ours, and seen the roads. They have developed their roads and made them sustainable, made them strong, made them resilient to, 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 to the floods and the rains and, the, and, and, and all, all of the other elements. They have built the roads and engineers nowadays have learned how to build roads depending on the conditions that can last a long time. We must stop patching up and, 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 and trying to make it one where you, you, you just say, that, okay, we have $20 million over four years to fix our roads and try to fix all the roads with $20 million. Nonsense. In this economic times, it can't happen with $20 million. But you don't have to take up $100 million in four years and do it. You can do it over a 20-year period. And that's what I'm saying, Madam Speaker, is sustainable development that this document speaks to. Let's plan them and let's develop them. Let's stop fighting about who, who, what a suit should be like in King Garden Bay and what it shouldn't be like. Let's get a proper plan of what it's supposed to be like and move towards making it what it's supposed to be. Suit in Eastern Long Look, wherever it should be. Let's make sure we make a plan and move towards the plan without every four years, as the, as the Honorable Deputy, Deputy Speaker says, every four years some government come in and change the plan. It doesn't make any sense. We must have an agreement that this is a sustainable development plan and we are moving towards it, Madam Speaker, so that people won't be poor, people can have better jobs, people can have better education, people, people, people can, can be lifted from where they are to where they should be, and, and, and therefore they will be proud of their, their representatives who would have helped them to get there, Madam Speaker. And that's what I'm talking about. People think I get upset and angry when I speak like this. And that's because I want the public to know it. I, I'm just a passionate speaker, I, emotional, but I'm not, I'm not as, as the saying, um, I think it was Alvin Bully, uh, one of those um, books on um, 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 Madam Minister Education. Um, I ain't vexed. I ain't vexed. Or, or I, may go to, to, um, I may go to Charles Dickens in, 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 in um, and in, in, in say, uh, Madam Speaker, people must be amused. I can't always be a, 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 a vex or can't be always. But I'm saying I, I get emotional and I speak my feelings out of emotion, but I ain't, I ain't vex. I ain't vex. Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, if I may, there's a page in here, page 61, which speaks of the SWOT analysis. And uh, most people in here who have done business plans know what we're talking about here. And this is a business plan, the SWOT analysis for the country of the Virgin Islands. What are our strengths right now? What do we have that is in the kitty that can make us better? The SWOT analysis, our strengths. What do we have that... That, that, that people can't take from us? What have we had that we can put to work? The strengths. It lists some of them. Unfortunately, I can, I can barely read it. But it says, low debts, low debt, we owe a little money, and we have a lot stored up. Low debt and high reserves. Low debt and high reserves. 
Sometimes you got to go out to the box, man, and speaker to, to achieve certain things. And, and, and I want the Minister of Finance to hear this because sometimes you have to go out to the box. No debt is not necessarily a strength. It may sound that way, but it's not necessarily a strength. It means that you haven't borrowed enough money to do what you're supposed to do to make the place better. So we brag about low debt, which is good, and a lot of people will say, oh, that's great. Low debt and high results. You don't borrow the money, and you put aside all. What that means, what it translates to? No development, no roads, no sewage. But at the same time, you have to be prudent like anyone else. And yes, you have to save some money for the rainy day, which is what reserves are supposed to be. And you're supposed to be able to, in having your debt, be able to pay it. So you have to be sensible about it. I agree. But you need to be able to see where you're going and what you can do to borrow money to build it, to develop the country. Every business, except those that are very rich, have to borrow money. Every day, every year, every time they go on a new plan or a new development, they have to borrow money to do it. In fact, in fact, even those who have money, they use, they borrow money, they call them using other people's money to do the development. So low debt and high, high resolve is the strength that's listed here. Large untapped fishing grounds. The blue economy, as we call it, the water is out there, 200 miles of it around us, that we keep talking about. I, 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 if I hear the word pelagic fishing again, I'm going to hit somebody. Because either do it or shut up. Pelagic fishing. You, you ever hear that word? Always talking about it, but we ain't doing nothing about it. The Japanese doing it, coming out, out, out there and do what they have to do with it. And we hear talk about pelagic fishing. Only because you can call a big word. Man, get on with it. Let's, let's, let's finance some people who are interested in it, get them some money to buy some boats and the, and the fishing thing or whatever it is, and send them out there. They ain't going to pay it back. But get them going. Let them start being in the fish and, 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 and fixing it up and canning it and do whatever they have to do to, to do whatever they have to do to sell it and export it. It's an economy. It's out there. So don't call a name again unless you, you put your, multi, your money to where your mouth is. Government or whoever it has to be. Put together a plan where you can get a group of business people uh, and the government to, to, to develop a, a joint venture to, to do whatever has to be done. That's how the Japanese and the Chinese and all them work together to get their people active in, in, in an economy. So let's leave the pelagic fishing alone, Mr. Minister of Finance, unless you're going to do pelagic fishing or whatever you might want to call it. I think it's, you find a new word for it now. Call it Tatola fishing and, and gather fishing, and uh, just on lake fishing, but make it fishing. Uh, now that, you know, it's time we get out of this, church, just throw you know, a little pot, a little, a little pot over the, over, over the side of a 20-foot boat and bringing in some little um, group and some snapper and saying we, 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 we're doing good. When we have all them countries going out there, off and together and everywhere and picking up our big wahoos and our big fishes, we do it for games. Remember for the 9th district and the at large member uh, from Bojano, we go out there behind, behind the drop, drop off and, we, uh, and uh, to show off that we can, we can find some wahoos. We go out there a certain time at the end and, and pull them in and then we say we're doing good by lifting them up during the August festival and say we have a lot of wahoos. But we're making it an industry. Madam Speaker, I've been there, done that, game fishing. That's one of the, the strengths. Large, untapped fishing grounds. Educated and talented population. I like that one. Because compared to many other countries, this country has a lot of educated people and a lot of people with a lot of talent. We just need to tap into it and make it work and continue to educate our people. When people hear of the education level of the Virgin Islands people, they're, they're, they're amazed in terms of the ratios of people who are highly educated in the Virgin Islands. But there's, there are some who are behind. There's some who are left behind. There's some who we have to, we have to try to, to encourage to get forward. We have, a, we have an entrepreneurial spirit. We like to do our own business. We have a stable economy, politically stable. We are a strong yachting sector. We are a large pool of cre creative people. We have a large pool of creative people. We are geographically located uh, 
We, we have a good geographical location. We have a low crime rate. We have violent, we have a, a, a vibrant private sector. When the Speaker Ireland thing there, I just call out, excuse the um, colloquial thing we're talking about, but uh, my people understand me and say, Ireland thing, I just call out, and still we can't run our own, own affairs? Man, speaker, yeah, all them things I just call out. And he, not in the list, not in the end of the list. All them things I just call out um, at large member, and we can't still run our own affairs. Them things, Madam Speaker, wasn't accomplished by nobody else. Them things were accomplished by the people of the Virgin Islands. And still you're going to tell me with all them things I just call out that we can't run our own affairs? Because somebody come here and tell us we have a bunch of hooligans? I don't think I just call up, Madam Speaker. Every country got hooligans. And you hope you can have your, your structure in place and your good governance and your accountability so you can deal with them when it happens. But it doesn't mean they can't run your own affairs. My people wake up. If I go there, I wouldn't finish, so let me don't go there. Weaknesses. We have a narrow revenue base. We only depend on the financial services and we're not paying enough attention to, to tourism. And we, we're talking about all the, the blue economy, the blue economy, it's done great, but we ain't doing a thing but the, the blue economy. You can turn black and brown soon. Poor public infrastructure, referring to the roads and all other things. That's a weakness we have. Roads, water, sewage, ports, we poor with that. Poor waste management. We still burning the thing. I, I, came, I came from Virginia, from Virginia the other day, Madam Speaker, I was talking about the tourists who were drove around. Madam Speaker, when I reached Beef Island on the boat and I got off, the tourists who I was, I was with, he said, Honorable Member, that's something happening over in Virginia over there. We just left over there, but something catch a fire. He thought it was a big fire. I saw it and I, I kind of tell him maybe, but I know what it was. I tell him maybe, and I turn my back, I tell him, let's go, let's go fast. But Madam Speaker, we were born in the garbage and Virgin God, all the smoke went up in the air. I couldn't let him see it too long. We just come from there. We just went onto the bats. We just had a good time down there. We went up to the North Song. And when he looked back, he sees smoke up in the sky. He thought it was a, 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 a he thought Virgin God was born in them. No. We can't, we can't, we can't be like that. And I can go down the list, Madam Speaker. There's, there's also the list of the opportunities. Fiscal space to increase capital investment. We have fiscal space. We can reduce our import bill by doing some other more creative agriculture. Not just, not just in, in, in the, small, the small agriculture that we, are, we do. Renewable energy, we, we, we talk about it all the time. I, I, I spend so much time on this renewable energy thing with our minister. I leave all kind of documents there. We start doing what we can. You, you go here, you get, get stopped. You turn there, you get stopped. Renewable energy, we have to be able to do it. Our country depends on it. Our lives depends on it. Green industries, fintech, and, 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 and trap this, this, this diaspora, diaspora, strength development partner relationships. Greater um, FDI, Madam Speaker, opportunities. And then we have our, 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 our threats that we have to deal with. But Madam Speaker, that's the SWOT analysis of territory. We need to pay attention to it and be able to do it. But Madam Speaker, allow me to just quickly speak, uh, if I can, on the issue of our, our, our goals. Health and wellness, an area we've got to focus and pay attention to. This, this document says that, 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 that there is some 70, 70 something. Let me see if I find what I was talking about there, where I made a note. I'm going to speak on the issue of health. We are a country that has a good, long life expectancy in general because of. Our, our ability to get good health care and so on, generally speaking. 77 years is our life expectancy, on an average. So I, 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 I have a few more to go, Madam Speaker. I pray to the Lord that he may give them to me. 77 years is our, is our general life expectancy, and it's probably growing. 
Ma Ma Madam Speaker, our population grew, it says between 20, uh, our, our population grew between 2010 and 2016 by 29%, about 4% annually. Although it dropped back in 2017 after the hurricane, but it grew. But it didn't grow, Madam Speaker, by, 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 by it, it grew by, by, by immigration to, to the territory mostly. Madam Speaker, I, I, I asked a question in my notes here, when was the last population census done? It's overdue. We are reading from 2010 statistics in 2023, Mr. Minister of Finance. How can you plan your, your finance on, on 2010 statistics? You're, we're guessing. 2010 statistics, and I don't even, I remember there might have been some issues with even the 2010 census. So I see in here that we, it's suggesting in here that we plan to have a census in 2022. But 2022 has passed. And I assume that report was because the 2020 census may not be able to, to be conducted because of the pandemic. So hopefully, Mr. 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 Premier, we can hear that there's going to be a 2023 census so that we can know what the population really is. Everybody tell me, people ask me, what's your population? 30,000, 35,000, 29,000, 28, 35. What's the real population of the Virgin Islands? How many are women? How many are men? How many are children? How many from, from here and there and wherever? What's, what's the statistics? How many people do we need to, 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 to grow our, our tourism sector? And how many are we importing? How many are here without jobs? How many, how many need to be trained in different ways? What is the census of the territory? So let's make sure we understand, as, as, a, as the Honorable Opposition Leader says, that these statistics are very crucial to our planning and to our sustainable development. This sustainable development plan, unfortunately, has been written on a 13-year-old census. Not good enough, Madam Speaker. So let's try and get that improved on. So the health care is important, Madam Speaker, as one of our major goals that we want to achieve. And then it speaks of education. Many members have, have touched on this. Uh, some of the members have touched on these before. I don't want to delve into them, but I want to just highlight them as, as, as we go along. Health and wellness is one. Number two is education and learning. Number three is the economy. I can speak all day on, on, on all those. I don't want to get there, Madam Speaker, because you gave me an opportunity to speak before lunch and maybe some people are hungry. But number four is the infrastructure. Number five is good governance and leadership. We are in the middle of that good governance and leadership uh, throw, as I would call it, and it's important because it has been highlighted in the, in the, in the, in the, in the last uh, um, um, COI, important, and we must pay attention to it. While we may not agree with everything that came out of it, it was an important document to show us that we need to to practice good governance and accountability and good leadership. So if we, were, if we were going in the wrong direction, we need to correct ourselves and go in the right direction as a sustainable development item. Very crucial. So we, mu we must pay attention to it. And number six, Madam Speaker, it says the Virgin Islands embraces environmental sustainability for sustainable islands development. We need to make sure that we know that our, our livelihood depends on our environment. Tourism depends on environment, Madam Speaker. Our health depends on our environment. Our, 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 our future, the future of sustainable development in terms of climate change and what can happen to our country in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years is important for us to pay attention to that we can make a contribution to what, what, what climate change means to the territory. So that's important, Madam Speaker. The six tenants on which this document is written so, Madam Speaker, I'll wrap it up uh, without delving into all of these six areas in any detail, but encourage people to read what they're talking about and pay attention and hope that we can take this document and take these, this advice and this research and use it for the good of the growth and development and sustainability of a territory of the Virgin Islands. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. At this time, we will take a break for lunch and return promptly at 3 o'clock p.m.
Good afternoon. This house now resumes its sitting. At this time, I recognize territorial member, Honorable Carvin Malone. Madam Speaker, I'd like to give thanks for the opportunity to lend my contribution from the other side of the aisle. The original side. Now, Speaker, the, um, this plan, the National Sustainable Development Plan, is one which I informed the Premier and I give him thanks for bringing this forward. I think it is insightful. I think that, um, as the Honorable Leader of the Opposition said, to, to have had this um, not brought forward would have been doing an injustice. Madam Speaker, when you look in terms of the development of the territory through the ages, through the times, it is critical that we give recognition to the works that has been done in preparing us to come and reach thus far. We've had situations where, especially, um, and I think it was in the speech from the throne, that we give recognition to the fact of the many legislations that were passed in this particular House of Assembly. This is critical in acknowledging the work that has been done to get us towards that era of self-determination. And I'll, I'll go there, because a National Sustainable Development Plan is one in which we must give acknowledgement, Madam Speaker, to the fact that we must prepare our people in building a sustainable Virgin Islands. And there are many features to this, but I would like to take it from two different approaches, two different approaches that we'll have. The first approach is in where does it fit into the greater <coughs> scheme of things? Where does it fit? I have been doing, together with a series of persons from Anagata straight down to Jocelyn Dyke, and yes, Virgin Gorda and Tortola are included in there. In terms of matching what we have said in our Constitution to what we have in terms of being ready, the Premier outlined in his approach, in the message that he had in having this specific uh, document that was laid before the table, the fact that in terms of all preparation for the future, where this document lies, it is critical that he did this. It is important that it is recognized, Madam Speaker, because we have reached this far by persistence. As we have said many times before, many of the successes that we have had in this country was met with resistance. Maybe it is because planning such as this was not on the table for all to study, all to agree, and all to be a part of. But with the keen works that Dr. June Simmer had um, have taken, 
in reaching to some of the suggestions with the level of involvement of the public that has been done. <clears throat> we can then, and I told the Honorable at Large Member, Deputy Speaker, that he will steal the headlines because, yes, no longer can we stop and start, stop and start, stop and start. If we have a fully comprehensive, integrated, and a plan that was brought into by the population, then it is easier for it to be adopted by whichever government because uh, <clears throat> it will be a development plan for the territory, not just for any um, partisan group. I know that folks like to write their names on certain developments. And if it doesn't come with a name tag, then they want to change it so that they can get the name tags on it. But the fact is, is that we don't have to reinvent any of the areas that have been brought into from early. I remember um, when we did the, well, well, I don't remember for the fort did the real tongue, was it charrette? Charrette. It was not a charade, it was a charrette. Yes, and some of the plans that he had in mind are now being implemented. That is, uh, he couldn't get it done. I took the honorable member today to get it done because he couldn't get buy-in. But sometimes you just have to, uh, once a good plan is a good plan, no matter where it comes from. And I know that the honorable member for the fort is now pleased that his charrette, some aspects of it, is being put into stead. When he came across in 2002, he emptied the purse. Parking lots all over. But it was part of a greater plan. Covering of um, waterways. All up, you can, you can save for the boats that are now parked on the road. Lower estate, you can drive two ways, up and down. But that's part of a bigger plan that was put in place. The plan that we have today, the plan that we have today, took into account about six different, six different sets of works. The National Integrated Development Strategy, NIDS, was orchestrated, planned out by um, Mr. Otto O'Neill did a fine work, so it's incorporated in here. The Recovery and Development Plan, incorporated. The Blue Economy Roadmap, incorporated. The Medium Term Development Plan, incorporated. The Medium Term Fiscal Plan, incorporated. And the National Physical Development Plan, incorporated. But this is what it takes. All of these pieces, and if you have them now all incorporated into one plan, who can argue? Who can say that um, you forgot the works that I did? I think that the charrette is part of these also. So that's incorporated too. Madam Speaker, the fact is that it is only through making sure that we have the incorporation of works passed, because we are not short on plans. We have a plan a day. If you go through all of the ministries, for the 52 weeks, you'll, you'll need more weeks to make up a year, because we'll have more plans in what weeks. So you'll have to break it down in terms of um, days. Uh, you have 260 working days, and you'll plan, you'll find a plan per day in the 260 if you go through all of the ministries. I know that the Honorable Member for Health, Minister for Health and Social Development, he had more strategies, plans, um, a lot of them because it's a big ministry. 
covers from birth to death and the statistics necessary in order for us to plan is what this here highlights, the lack of. We must be able to take this and the implementation of it is what will make a difference now. If this doesn't come with a person responsible for implementing, no matter how good of an intent the fourth house of assembly has in terms of having it done. And we must give recognition to the fact that the former premier, Honorable Andrew Foy, um, made sure that through the, with the funding that was provided, that it was allowed to happen. So too did the work of Dr. Carlyle Corbin. But we must not let them stay there. And the speaker, I will even contend and go as far as saying that they can become part of the curriculum, whether it's in the high school, senior high, um, whatever those grades will be, or in the college, that it become part of what we have so that it is embedded in the minds of our students. So that when they come and they take up their roles in this house, it will be based on a document that was produced back in, uh, well, completed and laid on the table this second day. What did uh, what did we have today? Second, this second day of February, 2023. We have a 2026 plan, and it is critical that the effort, the work, the contributions don't go to waste because it incorporates a number of other documents of which times and monies have been spent. So again, I give the Cabinet of the Virgin Islands praise for being able to make sure that it was completed so that we can then have it laid today. I will give more praise if we can immediately engage the person who will be responsible and set up a particular, um, set up a particular, what do you want to call it, commission, division, um, agency, whatever it is, for the implementation phase of this. This is good. What will be great is the implementation because we're not short on plans. But it fits a bigger picture, Madam Speaker, because when you look at the national vision statement that is stated in here, and I want to read verbatim on some of these areas, because if you don't read them into the records, then a number of persons, five years from now, will come and still ask you, where is the plan? They will hear it today. It will be repaired, uh, replayed and aired, highlighted in the news for days to come. And when 14 days has passed, folks will still ask you, where's the plan? But the plan is here. So the record must reflect that the plan is here. It says that the Virgin Islands embracing beauty and serenity, balance, development, and abundance with us and for us all. What's the overall vision? A well-balanced, people-centered Virgin Islands built on spirituality, social justice, and equality, nurtured by trust, cultural knowledge, and participatory governance, strengthened by economic, environmental, and social sustainability. Madam Speaker, there are guiding principles that are involved here. Our sister islands, recalling that a distinct cultural identity has evolved over centuries of struggle and asserting a right to freedom and self-determination, see preservation of a uniqueness at the heart of sustainable development. Our oral and written history must be uttered by all so that our character, the who we are, 
can be ingrained in our people, present and future. We cannot go without making sure that everyone is fully aware that these are, there are guiding principles in here of which you must read. We're not, we cannot read all of them because we will be here, um, I think, more than the 70 minutes that the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, because I want to incorporate everything that he said in here so we don't have to go through 70 minutes of it. I incorporate everything in there. So when we go through and we have the guiding principles and those are done, it, one of them involved that our development is inclusive of each of our settled islands, what they offer in terms of opportunities for diversity, diversification, and widespread progress while ensuring the consolidation and completeness of our distinctiveness. In the executive summary, there are two areas I would like to recite. The National Sustainable Development Plan is grounded in a vision espoused by the people of the country for their future. It is sustained by an implementation strategy in which the youth, gender, this, um, diaspora, and feedback are mainstreamed. These two documents demonstrate that the country is committed to the implementation, monitoring, and evaluation, and to the reporting on its progress. Success, however, will be dependent on collective ownership of the plan and collaborative partnerships between the people, community leaders, <coughs> businesses, and society. Madam Speaker, important to recognize that a series of six goals have been prioritized, and each goal would advance one of the key pillars of sustainable development, namely people, prosperity, planning, peace and partnership, in order to ensure a focus on the achievements on the national vision. These goals, number one, health and wellness, the Virgin Islands emphasis on healthy living and provides a structure for fulfilling lives. Number two, educating, education and learning. The Virgin Islands facilities empowerment through innovation, creative learning environment. Number three, the economy. The Virgin Islands has a prosperous, vibrant, thriving, and international competitive economy. Number four, infrastructure. The Virgin Islands emphasis on resilience building and the access to sustainable services. Number five, good governance. The Virgin Islands embraces good governance, accountability, government, and citizen part participation. Number six, the environment. The Virgin Islands embraces environmental sustainability for sustainable island development. These goals will provide and guide the sustainable development of the country and will give directions and regard, with regard to the budget and projects to be undertaken during the lifespan of the plan, 2036 plan. This will also serve as the baseline as well as the measurement for the progress as they are tied to the output of the plan. Madam Speaker, while, why it was important to understand this is because when we look at one of the one of the submissions that will be made or has been made to the Constitution Review Body, it exposes it exposes the concept that in our very constitution, in the preamble, in the vision of our people, it speaks of providing the institutions that will fulfill our people's aspiration for self-determination. In that vision, it also says that there's a commitment by the administrating state to assist in making sure that these institutions are fulfilled 
And this has been accomplished through the years, Madam Speaker. We have a propensity to resistance, which is oft overcome by persistence. There is not a major event in the Virgin Islands that has not been resisted. I can go through a number of them, but I'll just go through 10. Sorry about that, just a few. Uh, <laughs> resistance, when it comes to, uh, in the early days, secondary education. Folks felt that the seventh standard education was all you need. Send the folks away, save some money. That was resisted. Persistence overcame that. Resistance. When it comes to, uh, we're going to have a college. You can spend all that money and send the folks all over the world. You don't need it. It was, we had to overcome that. Resistance. When it comes to placing the college at Paracuta Bay, folks lie in the road. Don't put it here. Resistance. When it came to the social security, we had a case where uh, the opposition had to join with the government of the day in order to get it passed. Resistance. When it came to the uh, George Hill Road, and we talked about whether or not you would have to take a different route because that place is too steep to be had. So I think it could be renamed the Howard Penn uh, George Hill Road because when I read of the history of it, it is one in which he had to spare ahead almost um, by himself. And when it came to, um, when the engineer, chief engineer went away, he had to go and um, um, take the resources and make sure that he started it so that by the time they, they returned, it was already on the way. The road that led from King Garden Bay and met up on the hill, that too, hard work by individuals who basically took it on almost free of cost because other folks were talking about it can't be done. Resistance all the way, all the way through. There are other areas of resistance, but persistence beat it. So when you look at what we had to overcome, 1959, when they started to talk about full ministerial government, it was met with resistance. Those politicians would seek to become dictators. We can't give them, we must keep the membership system because if you go to full ministerial government, they would become dictators. So a mistrust in elected representatives is nothing new. It was not until 67 that we got that. When we had the choice in 62 to go independent, associated state, or to be integrated, it was met with resistance. We don't know what it means. We need more time to study it. When the United Nations sent down uh, a team to look in terms of how far you got from 62, we still did not know what all it took, so we needed more time. 2007, when the Labour government said, well, um, you have all of what it takes for you to make that other step and we will accommodate it. So we had a 12 member, I think it was board, they had terms of references that give us a constitution of which we are now proud. The office of DPP, the office of attorney general, the office of um, uh, the actual, the actual um, uh, cabinet system, partial as it is, national security system, all of that was part of the 2007 debate and the particular, um, and the particular constitution review. When the other governments came in, they said, well, we would rather you stay, although we know you have the right to go. And so this is why we did not have the other areas of our preparation being a part of this. So as we go into this constitution, we must resist, we must not accept any retardation, any regression of the progress made over the 72 or 73 years. It is critical that we move further ahead. 
we cannot subject our youngsters to a particular era of um, substitute because of our fear. The only thing to fear is fear itself. Get the justice system working if we have to. Pass the National Sustainable Development Plans. Look in terms of what it means to be self-determined. It is not just about independence. It, there are other areas. There are other two areas that have been added that is not recognized, but well, one other area not, not recognized by the United Nations. But if the people want to remain as a colony, and they have all of the education around it and still want to remain it with a modernized form of colonialism, well, it's a choice that they will have to make. But they have associated state integration, independence, and becoming um, a republic one time. I have my own plans on that, on my own views, sorry. But the fact is, is that it must be people-centered. And this National Sustainable Development Plan lends into our readiness. We have the social security system. We have our health care. Yes, there's some challenges, but you name me a country, including the United Kingdom, that has massive strikes that don't have issues. We all have issues. Throughout the world, there are issues. The education system strikes the law. Some of the visiting um, officials from the UK, they had to take their kids out of school. No teachers, strikes. Because they are affected the same way we are, and even more, by the pandemics, by the Ukrainian war, by high fuel prices, by all of these particular areas that we have. And we must know that our challenges are not unique. Challenges are all over the world, and we just have to face them head on and not be afraid of change. Change is always a scary aspect, but we must know. Let us get a period for education as to what it takes in all of the aspects of our self-determination say for two years, three years, because we're going towards the 2030, say for two or three years, educating every aspect. What are the benefits of staying as you are, the benefits, the particular disadvantages, the benefits of being an associate state, what does it mean? What are the benefits, what are the disadvantages? What are the benefits of being integrated? What does it mean? The pros, the cons, the benefit of the semi-independence route that we may have to take, like Jamaica, like St. Vincent, like Antigua, and the benefit of becoming like um, a, 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 a republic, like Barbados, like Dominica, like Guyana, like the other independent, like other uh, republic states, and having, your, uh, and having your president. Madam Speaker, at the end of the period, if we can get from this Constitution a period stated for education, a date stated for a referendum, a date stated for the transition, then we would have had, we could declare victory for this Constitution. If we don't have it, and we're only going to be, we're only going to regress, then the mark on this generation, this fourth house of assembly, but we have to recognize that the result of this study will be given to the fifth house of assembly. So if members want to participate in debating the result, they have to be returned. They have to be returned. Honorable Vanderpool say he does, uh, he, he is a statesman, he's not going to be returning to the fifth house, but um, he's retired about five times. So no doubt he may come back, may come back. But the challenge is, is that when we look at the participation, this will be given to the fifth house of assembly in order for us, who will be returned, to consider. 
They have to speak it as though it is. Madam Speaker, when you look in terms of going up to the UK, we must be able to tell the folks up there, we as a people, forget about this 1986 letter that you sent saying that we don't want any further political advancement. Forget about that. You didn't take a referendum. You made that conclusion yourself, and we don't adopt it, period. Isn't that true, Honorable Manable? Did you see any referendum? Did, were you part of any referendum back in 1986? No. Honorable Fraser, were you part of any referendum in 86 saying that you don't require any further political advancement? I think I heard no. But the fact is, Madam Speaker, that we need to inform the people. We need to let them know that we have done a lot of particular preparation for this time. The Social Security Act, 1980. International Business Companies, 1984. The College Act, 1990. The Medical Act, revised in 2000. Sorry, of, of actually 2000. The Virgin Islands Education Act of 2004. The Criminal Justice Alternative Sentencing Act, 2005. The Domestic Violence Act of 2011. The Virgin Islands Public Assistance Act, 2013. The Virgin Islands Youth Policy Strategy Framework of 2016, the National Health Insurance Scheme 2016, establishment of the Human Rights Commission, the Advisory Committee on the Prerogative of Mercy, the Cabinet System, the National Security uh, Council, the Commissioner of Police, the Attorney General, the Director of Deputy of Public Prosecution, the Public Service Commission, the Teaching Service Commission, the Judicial and Legal Service Commission, the Police Service Commission, the Auditor General, the Complaints Commission, the Register of Interest, all part of our 2007 Constitution. And Madam Speaker, we have more because in this fourth House of Assembly, we have been doing a lot of work. Work can done. In fact, uh, there was a listing. We had a proliferation of financing that was, that was the um, 1922 Act for Prohibitation Act of 2021, the Contractor General Act of 2021, the Whistleblowers Act 2021, the Virgin Islands Investment, um, Investment Act 2021, the Public Procurement Act 2021, Integrity in Public Life 2022, Virgin Islands Food Security and Sustainability Act 2021, the Business Licensing Act, 2022, the Jury Act, 2022, and now we have the Assessment of Self-Governance Sufficiency in Conformity with International Recognized Standards by Dr. Carly Corbin and the Vision 2026, Building a Stronger Virgin Islands by Dr. June Sommer. All preparation is here. We are the only ones who feel as if we're not ready. Education must be a part of what we have. But let us set the date, the time frame for education. Let us set the referendum date. Let us set the quote unquote date. Converse with the UK in terms of our first choice of cooperation. They're here already. I speak to them. We love them. But we want the self-determination that is cited that is all right. I mean, we don't want to be begging for it. It's ours. But we must get our people to come along in terms of what rights they have. And our people have to stop being scared of even learning about what their rights are. As soon as they hear self-determination, we don't want to hear about it. What do you mean you don't want to hear about it? If you want to stay as you are after you hear all, well, fine. Let's stay. But we have choices. We cannot be afraid to learn what your rights are. So, Madam Speaker, I will keep it short today and make sure that the message is straightforward. 
doing nothing, standing still, regressing, retardation, with Stockholm Syndrome, any of the others are not options. Let us go into the future with great enthusiasm. I thank you for my 20 minutes. Thank you, Honorable Member. At this time, I will call the Deputy Premier, Honorable Kai Reimer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to I give my full support to this national sustainable development plan. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, I must acknowledge the persons responsible for getting this document here uh, to the House. I remember it was early in the administration when we met with the, we had an informal meeting about the terms of reference for, for this plan. It was in, I think, 2019. And uh, I must acknowledge the then Premier for renewing the conversations to have this, to gain the assistance to get this plan going. We understand the importance of this document. Uh, Madam Speaker, so I acknowledge all the persons involved, Dr. Sumar, and uh, all the persons that added to this document to make it what it is today. And I too encourage persons to to read it, to get familiar with it. And uh, as the territorial, can territorial member, Smith, mentioned, you know, we have these documents and one government come in and uh, things change. What I would suggest is that any, as we go into election, any government should tailor their manifesto to this this document so that we could maintain what is there. It's only a 15-year document, but it's quite important. It's a very important document. And, uh, you know, the, the purpose, you know, it, it includes for us to raise our standard of living and quality of life for all persons within the Virgin Islands. Madam Speaker, as we, within the document, it would speak to the, some of the turnout for these, this consultation. Some were not as, not many persons, but we had a cross section of the territory that gave their input. So this document speaks to the voices of Virgin Islanders and residents. And to me, it supports a true sense of democracy because this is the people's document. It was created by the people and it speaks to its democracy. Madam Speaker, I know some years back we were, where we at as a territory today, I know some years back we were deemed as a bird sanctuary, but we have grown and we have developed into who we are today. And the importance of, of this document and moving us into the future, because as a territory, we always want to be at our pinnacle and you know, we are falling short in certain instances and you know, persons would hope that we will be further advanced. So Madam Speaker, this, this, this plan and the necessity of this plan is because you know, we're trying to achieve certain things, but if we do not have a plan, it is just basically a wish for us to get there. So trying to achieve something without a plan is just a wish. And this is a good document for us to to basically be a blueprint for us as a territory to move 
our territory forward. And Madam Speaker, it, it, it is it's breaking down into about six main goals, short-term, long-term, short-term, medium-term, and long-term. But it all speaks to those six main goals. Madam Speaker, and I know when I was growing up, my grandfather, you know, he was, he was a, they were farmers and, you know, growing up, we didn't have, expect that we would be where we are today. And though at times now we are trying to get back into our farming or, or the, the lifestyle that we want us to have, we know the importance of, of food sustainability and that is enshrined, enshrined where we must make sure that that is something that we focus on as we work to sustain ourselves. Well, Madam Speaker, though this is a blueprint, and it lay out everything, it lays out everything for us as a territory where we should go. It is important that we have some sort of an implementation unit so that we work towards getting these, these ideas in place. And with the implementation unit, we speak to our economy, we speak to our education, we speak to our health and wellness, our infrastructure. And Madam Speaker, as we work to implement these, we should have, should have uh, progress reports. These progress reports should tell us exactly how it's laid out, what we have achieved, what we're, what we're failing on, and how we need to get to that stage. I know when you, the UN have, have a document that was, I think started in 2015, where it has 17 F sustainable, sustainable development goals. And annually, at the UN conferences, they speak to uh, the progress of, of what has been achieved. And I know where it was, they're trying to achieve some goals up to 2030. There are 17 listed, and uh, you know there is that report, that progress report, that speaks to where we're at. And I think that is a, a good policy that we should adopt with this document as well. Um, Madam Speaker, in terms of education and learning, I know members have spoken to all the, the goals set forth, but it is quite critical as a territory that we are, as we are, educated, but educated and, and being able to come back and make a, a contribution to the territory, whether it's in, it would help with the economy, help with health and wellness as we, we, we struggle with the COVID situation with the, the, the nurses, we had to import nurses and doctors from, from, from Cuba. So we know what is necessary for us to sustain ourselves. And um, we don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that these are things that we need to, to focus on. Because sustaining ourselves as a territory is important. And with the detailed outline of how we are as a government and a people, we will work together to create a Virgin Islands that we all can be proud of. And the work done on this plan must be applaudable. Madam Speaker. And as we do the progress report, Madam Speaker, it would ensure that once we achieve certain goals and attained where we should be, that they're sustained and with no regression. So I, in my, my, my quick and, and short 
contribution, I just want to acknowledge the, the Premier for allowing us this opportunity to say, say a few words on this, this document. And uh, as I say, we go into the, the cycle, the election cycle, you would see manifestos, you would see different plans and different ideas coming forward, but I, I hope and pray that all persons would utilize uh, this, this plan and tailor it to what they would be using and, and, and selling to the people as we go into uh, the next election cycle. So, Madam Speaker, again, I acknowledge the Premier for bringing this forward. Not many documents are laid and we have the opportunity to say, um, to debate them, but you know, the, we understand the importance of this document and we acknowledge the, the foresight to be able to speak on it. And I encourage persons to get a copy of it again and be able to understand it and as we prepare for a future. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Thank you. I now recognize the Junior Minister for Trade and Economic Development, Honorable Shireen Flex Charles. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I too rise in support of the National Sustainable Development Plan, and Madam Speaker, I would ask your indulgence to review from my notes. But I want, I want to firstly say thank you to Dr. June Suma. When I first met her, and she gave me a little detail about her travels to the BVI, I felt very comfortable, Madam Speaker, because I believe she told me she's been coming to the BVI from the time she was about 14 years old. And she came every year to visit her sister. So, I found that fascinating, and I felt that we could not have found a, a better person because coming here to spend summers every year from the age of 14, that means you had to have a good idea about the people, the culture, and in general, the BVI. And what was even more fascinating that when she told me who her sister was, which was someone that I knew very well and my family knew very well. She came to visit her sister and that's how she would come to the BVI every year. And I realized that my brothers and sisters who came across the waters to attend the BVI high school actually stayed with her sister and so I, I felt that the BVI was in good hands having Dr. June Suma work on this plan along with others. And Madam Speaker, in my remarks on the National Sustainable Development Plan, I think it would be remiss of me to not begin with a candid and sincere commendation of their team for their diligent effort in bringing this document forward. Years before I was even an elected member, it was evident to me, it was to, as it was to many others, that as a territory considering our economic and democratic future, we must be able to do so against the greater backdrop of a national agenda. I am not speaking here, Madam Speaker, about empty politics or the trivial sort of discourse which I am displeased to say we have let become the norm and culture in the British Virgin Islands in the last couple of months as we have divided instead of unified ourselves against crises and threats. No, Madam Speaker, I am thinking of a true national agenda the questions should be asked of our elders. Where did we go wrong? 
What aspects of our culture must remain immortalized and undiluted, and what aspects should be discarded? What were opportunities of the past which we should now look to capitalize on? We must then ask our youth, what are your talents, your skills, your interests? What are your ideas of progress, standards, and norms which you value? What sort of businesses are you interested in opening? What kind of creative passions do you have? Madam Speaker, we are often inclined, especially as elected officials, to quote the late H. Honorable H. Laverty Stout in his iconic quote, where there is no vision, the people perish. But perhaps we would put even more merit to this statement if we understood that, in fact, it was not just a quote from a great man, but a divinely inspired scripture from an all-powerful God. So yes, Madam Speaker, I give my kudos in unending abundance to the diverse team and the brilliant minds who led the production of this document so that it could become part of the territory's collective discourse. But Madam Speaker, as I speak to my people today, I must share a degree of disappointment which I felt as I closely followed the direction this took. Madam Speaker, in the four years of my standing in this esteemed House of Assembly, I have earned a reputation for not mincing words, both inside and outside of these sacred halls. And I will not shock that quality of my mother's now for political points or any other. I am not pleased to say that while the team behind this document made a stalwart effort, in my opinion, to seek the engagement of the contributions of our people of the Virgin Islands, who are the greatest stakeholders and, the mo and those most affected. It is clear to me upon review of the facts that our people did not respond in numbers to the many prompts which were given to them to attend the many consultations that were held publicly throughout the territory. Madam Speaker, if I were to go outside now and a $50 bill were to slip out of my bag, forcing me to pick it up, there would be dozens of stories in the media. One story would say that I was caught stealing money that didn't belong to me. Another would say that I was focusing on my finances instead of the proceedings of the House of Assembly. Another would say that I did not bend down in the way considered appropriate for a woman. And Madam Speaker, I can assure you that in no time there would be hundreds of comments of negative, salacious, and otherwise just unpleasant language on each article. This is the sad song sung in our territory. We seem to have energy for the negative, sensational, and that which brings a brother or sister down. Yet when it comes to the forward progress of our territory, doing the real work that brings lasting change for our very own children, we become mum. We have no interest. A light drizzle keeps us from community meetings and a two-minute late start to a ceremony causes us to leave early. We cannot let the hard work of the NSDP team go in vain. I also must implore my fellow leaders from elect elected officials to senior public servants and even private sector industry representatives not to let this opportunity for progress pass. Too often, our own brightest have given us guidance on the way towards glory, and we allow the fruit of their labor to sit on a shelf and collect dust. The execution 
and action involved in seeing this plan through must become a point of absolute priority. I want to see us hold sensitizations across the board to ensure that everyone from the top down understands that it is on us to create the future for the Virgin Islands that we desire. What we have is worth fighting for. But before we consider who our enemies are, we must consider how we ensure that it remains valuable. Or we may find ourselves armed to the teeth for battle. For a battle, no one is interested in fighting because what we want to protect is of no more value. Madam Speaker, I look forward to seeing action as I have always been a woman, yes, of many words, but also of energy, drive, and a will to see things truly happen. I know that the people with leadership and guidance will remain at my back just as they remain in support of all my colleagues who prioritize the evolution and security of our, of, the, of our territory and of our people. So true to form, Madam Speaker, I end my remarks on this brief note. Let's get this plan circulated. Let us ensure that even the smallest understands our plan. And when we say our plan, it's the plan for all of us here in the BVI and let us work within its parameters to build a better Virgin Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. I now recognize the Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs and Sports, Honorable Shari De Castro. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I take this opportunity to rise and support of this document, the National Sustainable Development Plan. And it truly speaks to what I believe as legislators we are here to do, which is planning and policy that really drives programming and of course ensuring that the requisite processes are involved to be able to reach the end result or the output and outcome that we want to see. And truly, when we look at the national goals that have been articulated in the plan, it speaks to the reality of health and wellness, education and learning, a vibrant, thriving, and internationally competitive economy, of course, a resilient infrastructure, good governance and leadership, and of course, the environmental sustainability of these beautiful Virgin Islands. And I believe the plan is a very holistic view that has garnered great support from many persons within the community, from various industries, from various stakeholders that ultimately have a role to play in the development of this territory. I believe that sincerely an approach like this uh, speaks to the leadership of Premier Dr. The Honorable Natalia Wheatley and the entire cabinet in this unity government. Because holistically, if we seek to develop plans and policies, it ultimately outlives and it truly becomes a mark of legacy because it would be a plan, not that we would have articulated individually, but one that would have taken on a territorial approach that would have gone into our schools, into our community centers, into our communities, and would have sought out the vision of our people as individuals and as a collective. And I believe that under the leadership of the Premier's office and with Dr. Suma, the team of individuals would have done an excellent job in ensuring that this document is vast and wide and deep in relation to the content that is specific to sustainable development in all areas. Madam Speaker, I want to 
say that, you know, the reality is that as we seek to advance our territory, it's very difficult to truly come to some level of bringing it to fruition without having something written down. And we often speak a lot about vision and what it means and planning and what it means, but especially as an English educator, you know, being able to pick up a document and read it, I believe just having that level of engagement on paper that speaks to the reality of where we believe we are as a people and where we want to go, it allows for greater engagement and input. And as I've looked through it, Madam Speaker, I believe it to be a very great tool, even for our schools, uh, in relation to when we seek to upskill and develop our Virgin Islands history curriculum and our civics curriculum uh, and our financial literacy curriculum. The type of content that this document has collated is very much needed to shore up the curriculum and lesson planning uh, abilities within our social sciences department. And I believe it will lend itself to be a great resource. And I look forward to sharing it with, with the team in the Ministry of Education to see how the content can really be used to really allow our students to engage with this level of consultation on the type of programs and processes and policies that the government would want to see come to fulfillment. And so, overall, I want to beckon and encourage our people who would have had a hand in this plan to really pick it up, to really look at it, and I pray that we are able to create a mechanism. Of course, I know within it, one of the greatest elements of any plan is what type of monitoring and evaluation mechanism is in place to make sure that it works. And if it is that there are needs for amendments and changes, that there are elements in place to make sure that we do just that. And I believe that's the only true way that you could really assess and be able to figure out exactly where you are and be able to determine uh, the strengths and weaknesses and potential challenges and risks that would exist upon being able to assess at the various stages and at the various levels, especially given that this plan is a 15-year plan. It speaks to the reality of, over time, having the ability to evaluate, to monitor, and to adjust and adapt and be agile as much as necessary. And so overall, I want to endorse this document and I want to say that I believe that we are going in the right direction by ensuring that a plan, a national plan, is available to all our people that would seek to really give guidance to the type of legislative and political uh, discussions and discourse that would take place, as well as realistically the type of planning that would seek to show up, whether infrastructurally, educationally, environmentally, uh, health-wise, that we now have a defined plan that our ministries can really engage with and really flesh out uh, in line with our current policies that exist. And if there is need to create new ones, at least there is now an impetus and a mandate based on the data that would have been collected from consultation with the people. And so naturally, I believe that once these programs come on board, there will be buy-in because the people would have had a say in it and they would naturally engage with something that they had uh, the opportunity to really engage with. So overall, um, I'm happy that even as we, as we consider the time that is to come, at least we can go with a steady hand and with a steady mind as we seek to engage with the population on various subjects and in various areas because I believe this National Sustainable Development Plan creates a real, uh, in my mind as an educator, I'll metaphorically compare it to a table of specifications because if you're writing an exam, you have to have a table of specs and all of us would want to be tested in some way based on the output and the outcome that we put forward in using this plan and so it's important that we make sure that we stack ourselves against this mandate and see how our actions could really conform 
and develop this plan. So Madam Speaker, with, the, with those few words, I want to endorse this plan and I look forward to it coming to life and 15 years from now, we would have been able to say that on this day, we were able to lay this before the people and this honorable house, and the results of it would be one that would be to the benefit of the people of these Virgin Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. I now recognize the Minister for Health and Social Development, Honorable Marlon Penn. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank you for the opportunity to make my contribution to the National Sustainable Development Plan that is being laid before the House and debated this afternoon. Madam Speaker, I wouldn't be very long, but I think it's important for me to not sit here and not lend my voice to this very important document that represents a true bipartisan approach to the national development of our country. I believe for many years we've been discussing um, the, the whole discussion of a national plan for developing this country and for developing our people. And every year, every cycle, it changes because of who politically is elected. I believe the time has come for us to put aside the political wrangling and ensure that we have a very focused approach to the development of our country. Ultimately, that has to be our ultimate goal. Madam Speaker, I, before I go into any details, I want to first off thank the team from ACLAC, especially Dr. Suma, who led the charge in drafting and sort of bringing to finality this plan that is here before us today. In addition to that, I want to thank all the persons that led us to this path. I know the former administration, Honor Dr. Smith, started the process as well in those discussions and for continuing the discussions to where we are today with the current premier to get us to the point where we have a document that we could present to this house, a document that we could present to the, co the community and the public as a roadmap on a way forward. My speaker, many of the members have spoke at infinitum. I think I heard one of the, um, the numbers called, though, and I promise you I won't be that long. But I think the members sort of went into some of the details of the plan and how we got to this point, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we've had many plans, and, and this plan speaks to those many plans that we've had. And it's important for us not just to present another plan, but as members have said, we have to have a way of moving those plans into action. I think this plan requires a level of teeth, as they say, in legislative terms, they have to have some teeth, and the plan itself needs to have some teeth in terms of it actually moves forward and it is not caught up in the marry of the politics and the people of the country see progress in the level of development that's necessary for this country moving forward. Just for example, Madam Speaker, we have we the, the RDA. And the RDA, because of legislative framework, it has a level of agility to move and get certain things done. Prime example, the school. We're able to, from concept, conceptual drawings to tender, to um, procurement, to actual completion. I think in under a year, Minister, under a year, the entire life cycle of that particular project was conducted under a year. But yet, right next to the RD, right next to the same project, we're trying to we're still here in, the, in a basketball court. Well over a year an extension to a room, and we can't get back into our House of Assembly. It speaks to the bureaucracy that is, a, that is government, and, and how sometimes, not because of any particular fault of anyone, the bureaucracy, you get caught up in the bureaucracy, and the well-intended, the best of intentions sometimes get, doesn't get traction. 
And I think that the whole concept of implementation unit, and I think we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We know that the RDA is going through a transition. And, in, and as, as it goes through that transition, it needs to be reshaped into an en entity that focuses on national development, that focuses on developing the strategies and policies that are being discussed in this particular plan, and have the wherewithal and the tools to implement those strategies for the betterment of the country. So you have already have a, a basis, you have a system that could work. I think the development agency was particularly after the aftermath of the storms and those specific issues that are associated. There are tenants that are good, that should be, re that should be retained. And through this, through this transition, we need to now transition that agency into a national development agency that focuses on the long-term development of this country. Not just from an infrastructural point of view, but from a policy point of view. We also have to always focus on development. We tend to look at development as brick and mortar. And we're only building roads, and those things are important, roads and edifices that we could put our names on. But one of the most, most important elements that needs to be developed is the people. And I believe that that entity and the RDA can be, can, can be changed and morphed into an entity that focuses on national development of this country, infrastructure, its policies, and its people. So, Madam Speaker, I, I firmly support the principle and tenets of the plan. I think the important step and the important next step is to how are we going to make this a reality? How are we going to ensure that budgetary, there's a level of commitment every year, whether it's a 10% or 20% of the budget, goes to the national development strategy of this country. And you have the entity there in place to ensure that it's executed outside of the bureaucracy that sometimes tends to come with the government system. One element particularly, before I, I take my seat, about the overall strategy is the economic development. I think that is going to be critical as we move forward in terms of diversifying our economy. The plan has made mention of the particular threats and the instability. Though we have a strong economy, we have tourism, financial services. It makes mention of the vulnerability of those particular in industries and by, by extension the vulnerability of our economic sustainability. This is nothing new for us. We all know that there's a need for diversification. We all know there are areas where we could potentially diversify our economy. Again, it comes down to actually actioning those things and, and implementing. One of the areas I've been identifying in the member, the senior member, when your seniors speak to you, you have to, you have to listen. He spoke about the, the blue and green economy. And we've been hearing about this for, for some time, and, and I think it's important for us to action this. Action uh, a way forward to start to implement economic possibilities from this area. We continue to talk about fishing for decades, and the, and the plan speaks to the, the, the nautical miles and the fishing zones that we have as a territory. And particularly, it speaks to the potential within those waters. I know we're going through a mapping of our, of our sea, our, sea our, our seabed, as they call it, throughout the territory, which also would, would entail a mapping of the type of fish that we have within our, our, our sea, of our, our, our water, waterways, our environment. And it's important for us to really tap into that multi-billion dollar industry annually. I think Anigata Hashu Reef, as the last research, is one of the largest I think it's the top three, one of the top three largest barrier reefs in the entire world. And the potential in terms of those fishing grounds are untold. We need to stop talking about these things. I think we have a blueprint, so to speak, that sort of gives us a framework. But it needs to now move to the implementation stage and start to, to, start to practically build out what that industry would look like, how we're going to get our people involved in those industries, and economic opportunities that will be derived from their involvement in those industries. And this comes down to, again, to the critical component of data. I think we can't 
collect data, if we have the systems to collect, we don't have the proper systems to collect data. And one element that I see that was missing that should be more inclusive in this plan is the way that we are collecting data as a territory and as a nation that informs the way that data is represented. And we could do the necessary analysis that we could do make data-driven decisions. We've been talking about the government strategy for some time. I think it's critical for us to ensure that our agency, our implementation agency, takes up the responsibility to move this along, not just to streamline government operations, but also to ensure that, one, we have proper data collection, and we cut, cut down on our costs. And that will be an impetus for us to move forward in terms of making the right decisions in the right economic spaces. I know there's a, 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 a healthy discussion in the public space right now concerning the cost of living. And I think you have to strengthen the economic base if you're going to talk about how we're going to address the issues in terms of cost of living in the territory. And we have to ensure that we manage our costs as a government and as a territory. So Madam Speaker, this report represents, as I said, a true bipartisan approach to how we're going to move forward. And I don't want us permit to this to represent another report on a shelf, but let us move swiftly from the perspective of implementation. Look at the transitioning of the RDA as an entity, as an agency, into a national development agency that deals with the national development of this country, not just for the next 15 years, but it's a, it's a continuous process. But it needs to have, this process needs to have a level of independence from the political process. Once it's a territory-wise, a national buy-in, as it suggests in its name, that it moves and it's been implemented away from the political wrangling and a mari of politics that presents difficulties and in moving national initiatives forward. So, Madam Speaker, this report has my full support, pending us moving in a direction to make the necessary adjustments in terms of implementation and ensuring that the people are clearly, clearly educated in terms of its contents and in terms of the approach for implementation. So, Madam Speaker, I thank you. Thank you. At this time, I call on the clerk. Before I call on the clerk, I will call on the premier. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I just want to thank all the members who debated on this uh, National Sustainable Development Plan. I think most persons had Similar themes, of course, uh, kind of basic look at our development over the years, uh, some of the areas where we need to focus attention. But Madam Speaker, um, everyone agrees that this plan is a plan that needs to be implemented, that we need to, it's a good undertaking, but the challenge before us is to ensure that it gets into the hands of the people and that it gets into the hands of the different ministries, even the different um, partners we have, whether in the private sector and civic society, to make sure all sectors of our society are united in executing this plan. And it, this plan, Madam Speaker, shouldn't be seen as something separate and apart of the work of government it must be integrated into the work of all the ministries and all of the permanent secretaries and heads of departments must get this plan and familiarize themselves with it and seek to integrate it into the work of the ministries and the departments as well as the statutory bodies and we must create matrices is that a word matrices Mat matrices thank you We'll um, develop matrices where we can map um, the elements of this plan um, to the work of the various ministries. So, Madam Speaker, I think we've 
um, had a, a good debate. I'm happy that we have uh, we waived the provision to allow for the debate of this plan, and I'm looking forward to its implementation, um, Madam Speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you, Premier. I now call on the clerk. Item number eight, public business. One, government business. Thank you. I call upon the Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move that leave be granted to introduce the following bill standing in my name shortly entitled Police Act 2023. Madam Speaker, I rise to second the motion. Thank you. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that leave to introduce the bill shortly entitled Police Act 2023 be granted. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. I now call upon the Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I introduce the bill standing in my name shortly entitled Police Act 2023. I will explain its provision at the second reading. Madam Speaker, I move that the bill shortly entitled Police Act 2023 be now read a first time. Madam Speaker, I rise to second the motion. Thank you. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled Police Act 2023 be now read the first time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Upon the For the first time. Act may be cited as a police act 2023. Thank you. At this time, we'll just take a brief recess.
This house now resumes its sitting. I call upon the clock. It. <clears throat> Item number A2, private members' business. Call upon the clock. Nine, other business. Any member wish? I call upon the leader of the opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it's customary on other business, even though I may have forgotten what takes place in other business, it's been so long, that members would speak to things that are not a part of government business that they didn't have the opportunity to speak to in government business. Madam Speaker, I came here to this house on more than one occasion and admonished the government of the day to take advantage of a legal provision and one that is acknowledged and accepted by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office because it's enshrined in our borrowing guidelines to take advantage of the social security which by, by mandate, Madam Speaker, has the legal right to loan to government or its parastitial bodies up to 30% of its pension fund. And when I said that the government should borrow money from Social Security, there are persons in the community who take it to mean that it's a grant. And I want to make clear, Madam Speaker, that the, the Social Security relationship with the government or constitutional bodies when it comes to borrowing is no different from any commercial transaction done by, by um, a commercial bank. The government has to pay back the money with interest as agreed. So let no one believe that when I said that the government should borrow money from Social Security that they're going there to beg the Social Security for money and walk away with it. It's a loan. And those of you out there who have ever entered into a commercial agreement to borrow money, you know there are consequences if you don't pay it back. The government is no different. You know that when you borrow money, you have to pay interest on it. The government is no different. And if you don't, it's called default. And I want you to know that the government of the Virgin Islands, in its many years of existence, has never defaulted on its debt. And it, it's, there is no indication that it will in the foreseeable future. And that foreseeable future is long. So all I'm saying is that all Social Security invests money all over in the United States in various funds, including um, certificates of deposits and what have, have you. So loaning money to our, our government is no different from those investments. It's safe, safer than the investments that they're inv involved in because during the, the, during the, the, the um, 2008, I think it was, with the financial collapse, we lost millions of dollars. I never heard about the, the Social Security losing any dollar, a single dollar, by loaning money to the government. So again, Madam Speaker, I want to make it clear that this is a legal mandate requirement 
sanctioned legally, it's sanctioned by the FCO, you know, borrowing guidelines that all government can borrow up to 30% the pension fund. Our pension fund is over $700 million at Social Security. So we're not talking chump change or peanuts. So that puts us in the category of borrowing, being able to borrow up to $200 plus million from Social Security. And, and by the way, Madam Speaker, that borrowing is irregardless of our standings in the borrowing guidelines. Irregardless of our standings in the borrowing guidelines. And we don't need any permission from the British government to do it. At least that's the way it was before we got this, um, this protocol for effective financial management. Madam Speaker, there, there's a, there was a strange, of a, I don't know what you want to call it, if it's a report, a rumor, or whatever you want to call it, a malicious, in, uh, whatever, I don't know. But it was talking about, it's out there, it was out there, that our Premier slept on the floor of an airport in Antigua. Now, now, that is so strange to me. Unless, unless the Premier was playing hooky and he disappeared from the co close quarters that he's supposed to be in, went out and came back and found himself on the floor of the airport sleeping, these kind of things can't happen. And unless he wanted to do it, because I know, Madam Speaker, if our Premier is traveling or even a member of the House of Assembly is traveling and they're going through Antigua, when they get off the aircraft, in his case, he don't have to wait to get off the aircraft, they'll escort him off the aircraft to the lounge. So they would have had to kick him out of the lounge then for him to sleep on the, on the floor in the airport. I, of course, if this happened, it's because he wanted it to happen, Madam Speaker. And I don't believe that this is something that we, he wanted to be on the streets of Tortola. Because it doesn't make the government of Antigua look good. So you could say what you want. I see where they're blaming the local staff. I can't believe that the local staff here, his protocol officers and what have you, would have him travel and not make all the regular, the, the, the regular necessary protocols for him when he's traveling. I don't know if the Premier wished to, to let the general public know the story or the details. I, I purposely never asked him about it. This, we never had a conversation about it. But I just thought that based on my understanding and knowledge of, of traveling, and for what I've seen printed, something isn't right. Madam Speaker, I want to talk about increments. I don't like the idea of running into a public officer and having to learn of the horrors that the public officers are being put through when it comes to their increments. You can say what you want about these public officers, Madam Speaker. You could say some of them are rude. You could say some of them doesn't have doesn't have the, the, the uh, proper training to be in certain places because they're not courteous enough to be in these places. You could say they're inefficient. There are a lot of things. There, there, are, there are a lot of things you can say, Madam Speaker, about public officers. But also remember that there are good things you can say as well. But of all the things you can say about public officers, you cannot say the same about all. A hungry man is an angry man, Madam Speaker. And hunger, in the case of public officers, means that they're, they're not paid. If you don't pay them, you, you can't expect to get from them what you, what you expect. I'm being told that the, the increments are outstanding for, from since 2019, I think it is. It could be, it could be as far back as uh, after, just before, the, I think the last one maybe they got was 
during the time of the hurricane, they, they were preparing it and they finally got it or something to that effect. But whatever it is, we're in 2023 right now, Madam Speaker. It's 2023. We collect from financial services, Madam Speaker. Last time I heard it was $202 million. We collect taxes and a host of other means of, of gathering revenue. Those are the people, Madam Speaker, who does that collection. I never seen anyone collect government, government revenue other than a public officer. If you have public officers who are not living up to their expectations, if you have public officers who are slacking off, if you have public officers who don't come to work, well, deal with those individuals, but don't deal with them like, like across the board. Don't make the innocent pay for the guilty. I think, I think, Madam Speaker, public officers should not be treated like, well, when was the last time a, a, a legislator got a raise? They should not be treated like, like people like us. So they need to get their increments. And one of the things that this government can do, this government has at least up until June 15th, June 12th, at least, well, not at least, at best, till June 12th. It could be shorter, but they have, they have until June 12th to do something. I'm not saying that they would get any monies into the, civil, the public servant's hand within this period, but they can, they can initiate the process of making it possible for these people to start getting their increments. I want to say, Madam Speaker, that my colleagues in the House of Assembly by now should be wise enough to understand how the public service works. At least those portions of the public service that they need to understand works. You see these folks that sit here, these two public servants that we have, Madam Speaker, they would come here and sometimes we keep them until, well, According to our standing orders, we're not supposed to have a sitting beyond 9 o'clock, 9 p.m. But we know different. We've seen it go up to 1 o'clock. And these public servants, Madam Speaker, they, they have to be here. I mean, the seats need to be filled. And it's always these officers who does it. Can somebody tell me whether or not they get paid for that time? Can anyone tell me if they get paid? When we have standing finance, that's a whole other story, Madam Speaker. But the persons in the public service who are responsible for paying them, Madam Speaker, they are compensated. When one of their deputies are not in office, for whatever reason, whether they, 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 the position is vacant or not, or something, but as long as you see they don't have a, a deputy, they get compensated for not having a deputy, or because their workload went up. But these people, people, these people who I'm talking about, who are complaining about their increments, no one pays attention to them, to, to their needs. So you know, Madam Speaker, one time I was in Miami and I went to, I think I went to purchase a vehicle. And I said to the guy, well, um, I need so-and-so added to the vehicle. And he told me, that's going to cost me so, so, so. And I go like, I start haggling with the guy now, telling him, well, geez, you said another $1,800, why not make it sixteen? He said to me, 
the price is the price. If you want to pay me sixteen hundred, you're going to get something for sixteen hundred, not the one I'm giving, not what I'm giving you for eighteen. Okay, you want you want something? To, the price is the price. So I learned, Madam Speaker. If you don't pay people according to their worth, they're going to give you what you pay for. Do we want that to happen? No. I've been watching over the years that I, since I've been in this House of Assembly, Madam Speaker, I've been watching. I've seen where we had hand-sawed reports. Before we came to debate the budget, we went through standing finance, and before we came to debate the budget, we were, we were editing the hand-sawed report. I've seen that. We did that. Nowadays, it's a whole other story. We're lucky if we get a minister that the, the, that the, 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 the four uh, staff who have to labor and handwrite it. And, and I, I don't know how to do it. I'm sure they don't get extra money for that. If they do, they probably get it five years later. When they even forgot what they're getting paid, what they're getting paid for. We used to have voluminous, voluminous uh, documents from standing finance. Where are we going with this, Madam Speaker? Where is this taking us? And like I said earlier, some of that blame, a lot of that blame lies with us. A lot of that blame lies with us right here in this House of Assembly. And it's because, again, like I said earlier, we are not doing the checks and the balances that we are supposed to do. And the reason we're not doing it is because we don't have the resources to do it. It's all, it all comes down to resource, resource, resource. So do you want a full bag of half-baked potatoes or half a bag of well-baked potatoes? If they're half-baked, you can't use them. So they're useless. So that's what we're getting. Or that's what the public is getting. Service that is half-baked. So let's step back, a, let's step back a, a little, Madam Speaker, and look at, get a better perspective of the things that we are charged to do and do it right. Madam Speaker, I learned a few weeks ago, it's not even, it's probably a single week ago, but a week ago, that the general manager for the BVA Electricity Corporation is no longer there. I understood that he got a notice telling him that his services are no longer needed. Well, I know you're going to say that, but um, that's after you probably agree that he could stay on another year. But the bigger point that I'm trying to make, Madam Speaker, whatever the circumstances, the bigger point that I'm trying to make, and this is a big point, and I, want, I hope you hear this the same way you heard that. I want to look at you when I'm saying it, because it's, it's, it's important, Madam Speaker. I've always said that the water and sewage department will be better off as a statutory body. And I applaud the government for bringing that document before us to order, in order to have it happen. I supported it. I also said that I'm going to wait and see how long it's going to take before the process gets into motion. And I said also that 
the model that they should follow is that of the BBI Electricity Corporation because it's already established, it has track record in doing exactly what the water and sewage utility is expected to do. I can think of nothing better that this government can do than to get, give Mr. C Mr. Abram a commission to head up that um, water and sewage corporation. I can think of nothing better. I, I'm sure that Mr. Abrams isn't looking for a job because he would be needing a break from what he's been going through for the last 25, 24 years at BB Electricity Corporation as general manager. But his expertise are invaluable to what we need at the, at the Water and Sewage Corporation. So whether you bring him in as a consultant, which I, I would prefer if he was the person that gets the commission, run that organization on a short term, maybe two, two years, three years at, as a max as a, in the first instance, and let him go, let him he go off and do what he wishes to do. But it's a resource that we have here in the Virgin Islands. You don't have to go teach Mr. Mr. Abrams when, I, when somebody calls the water and sewage department and you say Cocodella, you don't have to go bring him, drag him to show him where, where it is and all he knows. He knows where Shepherd Hill is. He knows where Wrong Hill is. He knows Cox Heath. These, are, these, are, these things are important, Madam Speaker. And I, I would, I would I implore the Premier to make sure that something like this takes place. Whatever the circumstances under which Mr. Abrams is no longer at the Electric Corporation, whether it, 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 he left on good terms or bad terms or whatever it is, the whole idea is it's an expertise that we have here. It's one that you don't have to go through the motions with. And I want you to know, Madam Speaker, that the BVI Electricity Corporation was at one time a supplier of water to the government. Yeah, they supplied, they supplied government with, with potable water. So he knows. He's no stranger to it. Give, him, give the man a decent commission. Don't, don't try to nickel and dime him. Don't try to make him less than who he is. It's a skill and an expertise that we need because God in heaven knows, as he is all our judge, that water and sewage department needs help. Speaking of which, Madam Speaker, speaking of water and sewage, what's going on with the Bird Point sewage treatment plant? By now I expected that to be up and running, fully, fully operational. I don't, I don't want for my good friend, the minister, to have to be answering for this on the campaign trail. I think he should get that behind him and don't have to worry about that one. You know, they say if you, if you break it, you own it. If you break it, you own it. It's yours. Well, the time has come now when we're all going to have to take ownership of these things. But there is a saving grace. You can fix them and walk away from them. And that's one of the things I think can be fixed and we can walk away from. Madam Speaker, there's a strange little, a little, a little nuance. It's something that I think could get fixed and get fixed quick. It's just the other day I was talking to someone and they said to me, I, I have to go and pick up my trade license. This was, this was um, Tuesday, today's Thursday. This was Tuesday. I gotta go pick up my trade license since I have to pay a penalty. I said, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, you gotta, you gotta get your trade license renewed between, uh, on Jan in January from 1st to 31st. 
Madam Speaker, that, that work when, you know when trade licenses first came out? You had a couple companies. That worked then. Just like, just like um, automobile. We used to renew our automobile license. We used to do that in January of each year. Just like a driver's license, you renew that in January of each year. But it becomes impractical to do that. And I, and I think the trade licenses are at that point, Madam Speaker, where a person should renew their trade license once a year on his birthday. Instead of having people who come there and say that we know the trade license in January. And, and, and besides, there's a penalty. I think the penalty should be, if there's a penalty, the penalty should be that you pay for the entire year. Whenever you come, if you come in August, you don't tell me, well, I missed six months, so I don't have to pay that six months, only half a year. You pay for the full year. That's a penalty. So, I think these are quick fixes that, that the, the government can fix. You can change, change the, 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 that's probably a regulation they could do in cabinet, the date of the license renewal. But it, it, do, a lot, it do a lot of good for people who have to go through all these, these um, ridiculous changes in their life. Another thing, Madam Speaker, The liquor licenses. We passed a bill here for liquor license. And my good friend, the, the, the member for, the at large member, Smith, who voluntarily, graciously accepted the responsibility for giving it the public consultations, would know that all is not well. And I think a whole lot of reason for all not being well is because there's supposed to be a commission responsible, a board, a commission responsible for administering and regulating these trade licenses and the companies that they issue them to. I don't, I don't like the whole idea, Madam Speaker, for a person or persons living in Yoswendaik or, or Anigara, having to call me all the way down in Tortola to deal with matters regarding the nuisance of noise in their neighborhood from businesses to whom trade licenses were issued and there's no one who seemed to be wanting to take the responsibility to to arrest this whole non nuisance. Now don't get me wrong, I don't mind them calling me. I'm saying for their sake, it's not right for them to have to call me. And, and, and I, I'm here to serve. There's no problem for them to call me, but it's wrong for them to have to do all of that. And there, there, there seems to be no relief yeah, I know I have my problems here in Duff Bottom. That shouldn't be. I've told the people in this neighborhood that, yes, we passed a liquor license law, and I know what's in that law. And if that law is executed, Madam Speaker, there should be no nuisance like, like what we've been having. I told them that. We got the problem licked. But do we? When is this board going to be established? You know, you don't, you don't just come and, and pass a law and just walk away from it and, then, uh, and say, well, well, we have the mechanisms, the design for the mechanisms are just not in place yet. We are looking for relief. This, these issues, issues like this, this is, what, this is what makes a government, a functional government. You want to have a litany of stuff to tell the public that you have done. Don't tell people that you passed legislation. I passed legislation. If you pass the legislation and it's not enacted, it's not being enforced, it's not, so what good is it? 
I think that we have some work to do. We don't have a lot of time to do it, but there is time. And this is one of the things that I want to see happen. I want to see that, that, that issue um, resolved. I want to say to the people that, that works, uh, has, the people that has businesses on Board Point, you know, the, the, the issue with your road, the road on Board Point is not a new one, it's an old one. There are several matters are contributing factors to that road being the way it is. One, of course, is the bed. It's a sand bed, so it's not going to not going to stand up unless special attention is given to it. I think that it is high time that special attention be given to that road. It isn't. It isn't like ten years ago when when there were a few things happening there, and some of, some of them were, were uh, government, the police base, and the uh, yacht club. It's a long time ago, and now the sewage treatment plant and things like that. As a matter of fact, as I said, the sewage treatment plant is in, it's, it's incredible because I understood that government has offices in that building. It's just, I don't know if, if incredible is the right word, but it's, it's, it has, a, it has, a, it has a, a, a role to play in this, in this description. It's ridiculously incredible that government has offices out there. And I'm not talking about water and sewage offices in the sewage treatment plant. But Minister, you and I need to have this conversation because we can do something about the road going out to Bird Point. And, and don't look like me, don't look at me like, yeah, put a smile on your face. I mean, don't, don't look at me like the, the, the cat who got lost his cheese. I told you, it's better off being done here than out there, right? So I'm letting you know that these things can come back to haunt you. So let's get these things done. These are what we used to call uh, when I came into public service, it's called quick wins. Yeah, you could you could knock this off. You got <laughs> supposedly supposedly you have an asphalt plant that I've been here about for the longest time. Get the asphalt plant up and running. Let's put some asphalt on the road. Huh? Let's put some asphalt on roads. Let's get things going. Can't when you in your quiet moment in your quiet moments, impressed upon the Minister of Finance that he's also a district representative. And these are things that district representatives must do if they want to represent. Right? One of them is to get all these different roads that we have. I, I, I got to applaud the Premier for at least, I don't know, I don't know how we did it. But he got this raided program out there. Lord have mercy. <laughs> People could be innovative when they're pressed. We got this raided program out there and we're getting a little bush cut, but <laughs> thank you. Okay, we'll deal with that board point road. The incinerator. The minister is not here. But the incinerator isn't going away. It's still in my district. And I've been promised that we're going to get that incinerator fixed. And all I'm seeing is the hillside being gouged and gouged and gouged. And the reason that's been gouged is because the incinerator is broken. You can't allow people to throw their hands up in the air and leave things alone, man, uh, Premier. It's your government. No matter what, you're going to hear about it. Likewise, my senior citizen program, Madam Speaker. As long as I am breathing fresh air, 
especially if I'm standing in the third district. These are things that I'm not going to drop. So don't expect not to hear about them. I want my senior citizen program up and running. I want to see the incinerator fixed. I want to see that sewage treatment plant at Bird Point fixed. I don't want to see my constituents complaining about water. And the rest we will take care of. It's not because I'm coming here public and talking about these things and I haven't spoken to my ministers. We have conversation regularly. Not one of them can tell you that I don't talk to them, but I opt to come here and speak publicly. I told, my, I told these ministers from the time they came into this, uh, this, this House of Assembly, I explained to them how this thing works. I said, Minister, if you don't deal with these things, they will come back to haunt you someday. And up to this day that I'm here talking at this 11th hour, there is still time to fix things. There is still time. I've had cooperation from ministers to cooperate with me. I cannot say different. I've had worse times, but they cooperate with me, all of them. Like I just mentioned, the, the, the Premier and his, his program, I think that the same program is run, the same way the program runs in other districts is running in mine. I can't say that my district is being cheated or anything to that effect. But it doesn't shut me up. Because if something isn't going right, I'm going to talk about it. And God knows a lot of things are not going right. There are things that are going right. I do get my share. And Premier, I'm still concerned about those derelict boats in Sikorza Harbor. I think I need to see something happening. And again, these are unnecessary evils. These are things that you don't need to be hearing about if you would only fix them. Madam Speaker, the, the, in my district, there were still issues of sorrow to deal with. People who are passing on. December 29th, I had Julia Sproul. She passed. Someone I had seen just a few days before, only to receive a message saying, my grandmother has passed, and I'm trying to find out, well, this is a joke. And I sent send back a note saying, which one? Obviously, it was a rhetorical note because the, the, the person only had two grandmothers, one had already died, so it could only be the one. It shattered me, Madam Speaker, because Julia was my cousin, and she passed. Then I'm looking at another cousin who just passed. Another cousin who just passed on, on January 16th, Kyron Forbes, Winfield. Bob's. It's, it's amazing, Madam Speaker. We've had a, I think, Frenchie, Walter, was living in Manuel. He passed. And I've done, I had done my message, Madam Speaker. For the holiday, I've done my holiday message, and as fate would have it, I had to do it over for, for a specific reason. And within that time, that little, that narrow window, I had to add like three more people onto my list of the persons who had died. I just want to stand here this, this afternoon, this evening, Madam Speaker, and, and extend my condolence to, of course, we had. Re, uh, Riff and Sika, we used to call Ross White. He was, he's one of those who passed as well. But I want to stand here this, this afternoon, this evening, Madam Speaker, and extend my condolence to all those folks in my district who 
have lost loved ones, and of course to the entire territory where so many people have passed and keep passing. And to let them know that even though we legislators are no longer in a position to do the things that we did, we did it religiously to assist loved ones when there's a passing. We still have that same level of commitment and compassion for them and we mourn with them as they go through these moments of grief. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. I call on the Premier. I, I recognize the member for the ninth district, Honorable Wheatley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, there were two minutes left. You all and uh, any other business. Madam Speaker, I just have a, a few. I would not be long, I promise. I was um, over in the gala today with the overseas minister, and so I got here a bit late. And the members have been here since morning, so. But I have a few things I want to mention before I take my seat. I did have a chance to listen to some of the debate on the National Sustainable Development Plan. And I must say I concur with what I heard most members say, particularly the ones that indicated the need for the continuity of government on the same agenda. I think it's very important that we have stability in terms of an agenda. And I was very pleased to hear the debate this morning on that. Madam Speaker, I'll, I'll start where the member for the third left off, where I bring condolences to those persons who've lost loved ones since the year began. I had quite a few in my district. I had one just uh, two days ago. It's uh, Gloria Harrigan, uh, a dear friend. I spent a lot of time with her. She was someone who every morning you could guarantee a Bible verse or some kind of encouragement. And also my longtime friend of Gafford Potter, who his wife, parents, I grew up with them. So I knew from the time I was a very little child and I bring condolences to those families who lost these loved ones. This is never an easy thing, Madam Speaker, to have to deal with. Madam Speaker, Section 61 of the Physical Planning Act 2004 and Resolution Number 7 of 1989 makes it very, very clear how beaches are to be treated in the British Virgin Islands. Section 61 of the Physical Planning Act 2004 and resolution number seven of 1918. I think persons should make themselves familiar with those two things, because I'm seeing a little trend, Madam Speaker. We posts are trying to, for lack of a better word, privatize certain beaches, particularly in Virgin Order. I think it's not the way we ought to go, and persons ought to refrain from complicating beach use. Beaches are public. You should have access to them. Now, Speaker, we know we are, we are tourism in the ninth district, and we respect persons wanting that feeling to feel like the beach is private. So we will not go and interfere on certain beaches. And the properties understand that. But when you're going to deliberately and intentionally try to prevent access to beaches, I, I think that's, a, that's, that's problematic. It's something we ought to, to refrain from doing. We know, we know this. And we expect those persons who live close to beaches to not feel or act like because you live close to a beach that somehow it is now a private beach. We understand the tourism product and sometimes selling homes. You want the people who are coming to 
visit your property to feel like they have an exclusive beach. We understand that. They can't take that too far to then start to try to make it a private beach because you advertise it as a private beach. And Madam Speaker, I'll leave that there for now and I'll see how these things develop over the time. Madam Speaker, I've been asking some questions lately and I, I got a member for the tour to raise the issue of noise. We have the Liquor License Act, but apart from this noise from businesses, road noise, and even in some cases I've had several complaints lately of helicopter and plane noises. If I'm not mistaken, these, these planes and helicopters I think have set routes to where they don't necessarily fly over residential areas. But I'm seeing an increase where some persons are flying directly over homes and persons are beginning to be disturbed in their homes by the excessive noise from helicopters, trucks, motorcycles, and the like. Now, Madam Speaker, when you have time to sit down and talk with people and visit them, you get a lot of information. And I was quite pleased to learn that very, very recently that some remote places in the BVI are getting some nice service international flights to remote areas of the BVA. I, I, I like that. We are tourism oriented and we must make our tourists or uh, people traveling to the BVA to get here as quickly and as conveniently as possible. But Madam Speaker, I've been asking this question for the longest while. Why can't Enegara have the same privilege of international flights? If international flights are going all over the BVA, for some reason we, we can't figure out how to get an international flight to Enegara. We are persons flying from Europe, America, but they must stop from Puerto Rico or St. Thomas into Beef Island and then to go over to Enegara, thus delaying the arrival at Enegara. We went to the extent to get uh, night lights, we did everything we could do, but for some reason Enegara still can't get international flights. People who visit I interact with residents and tourists alike, and I've heard this from tourists several times, why do we have to stop in the island? Why can't we fly from Puerto Rico or St. Thomas or anywhere and fly directly to Enegara? Like I said, Madam Speaker, there are other international flights going to other parts of the BVA that is not the island. So why can't we get the same service going to Enegada? People are complaining bitterly about it. We are tourism, and we want to make tourists and our locals to get to their final destination as quickly as possible. And when I speak a while on the issue of, of tourism, I'd even forgotten that years ago we had a beautiful tourist board office in Virgin Garden. I think it was probably destroyed in 2017. And five years later, there's still not a tourist board office. I, I must thank those, those young ladies like Monique, who are doing our very best. I saw her at a dark this afternoon, at a sort of German tourist there, and you see how she's interacting with those persons, answering questions, giving directions. But we need an office there, Madam Speaker, and I, I hope this issue is rectified sooner rather than later. Madam Speaker, I'm almost there. Madam Speaker, on January 10th of this year, I attended a court uh, church service for the opening of, the, of the, the court year. And following that, I went to a special sitting up at the Sakal building. And I listened with great pride to Dame Janice Pereira give her overview and all the various things she lamented on, some of the inefficiencies and shortcomings of the court, and certain things that she would like to see improved. She went to great lengths. That justice delayed is justice denied. The length of time persons have to wait. They have their cases called, and all of that. And the thing that, that, that caught my attention most was the issue of the Child Maintenance Act. It was from 2017. Madam Speaker, we brought us act to the House in 2021. There were some issues with the Child Maintenance Amendment Act 2021, 
came to the house, but it was withdrawn. Madam Speaker, we need to try our very best to get this Child Maintenance Amendment Act back to the house. I'm seeing a lot of cases and hearing a lot of cases where persons are suffering, both male and female, because in the court sometimes make rulings about the, the, the payments for child support. It's not happening the way it should. And I think this Amendment Act 2021 was designed to address some of the shortcomings of the current act. I think, Madam Speaker, we had to push to get us back on board as quickly as possible. I didn't see it in the speech from the throne either. But Madam Speaker, this here needs to come back in. We cannot have single mothers or single fathers going through hardships because the delinquent person feels they shouldn't be paying anything to support their children. So it's left up to one parent. And some are really, really, really struggling because of the, the current system. They said justice delayed is justice denied. Madam Speaker, I'm getting a lot of complaints again at the, the two wrong years ago with um, persons in the, work, in the workplaces. Particularly, we have mixed, mixed workers, workers on work permits and workers who don't require work permits. There seem to be a practice. I, I've seen it before, but it kind of died down. But it seems to be coming back and coming back in full force, where the persons on a work permit are given more hours than those without. I think something, and I, I think I understand why that may happen, because persons on a work permits, some of them may have contracts dictating certain things. And I find with employers to, to work their way around that issue, they are giving the work permit holders the preference over the non-work permit holders, and I think that is wrong. And I think well, the minister is not here at this time, uh, Cliff Menegada, but I think it's something we need to, to look at again and make sure the employers understand how to handle belongers versus work permit holders in the workforce. It may not be intentional. I don't think it's intentional, but I think out of other obligations, it is happening. But I'm hearing it too frequently now, and it's something that we need to look at and remind these persons how you handle that situation. The belongers or those who don't require work permits versus those who do. The labor code is very, very clear as to how that matter should be handled. So hopefully the, the Minister for Labor when he's here will send out a memo or a reminder to persons how to handle that situation. But what I'm hearing is not right. It's not a correct thing that they are doing. Do you want me to understand where they may find themselves doing it? It is not the correct thing to do. Madam Speaker, I want to commend the Virgin Island College campus for the excellent job that they're doing bringing programs into the Virgin Island community. Every, almost every single day, I see a new program being offered, whether it's be safer building, computer literacy, about masters, about, uh, master's courses and so forth. And I must commend them. Because what a community college is supposed to do is supposed to enhance the capacity of the communities in which they find themselves. And I think over the past, maybe they've been a, a little lacking. But I'm so pleased to see what the college is doing right now in Virgin Island. It is commendable. I believe one of the biggest investments we can make is to invest in our people. And I see the college doing this. Well, NASA's Sustainable Development Plan speaks to this. And if you're going to be developing in a particular way, or people must, is who's going to take us there? That last member said it earlier, we are the ones who have to come together and push this country forward. And you do it through the educating of your people. Madam Speaker, as I close off, I want to close off on a, a, a topic again that I'm seeing more and more issues. It's raised several times in this house. I think the first one I was raised in this house was by the member for the third district. And it's an issue of, of mental health in our community. And the speaker, the people in the BVI have been through a lot of, since the hurricanes of 2017, the floods, the pandemic, and all that has transpired. 
it is affecting different persons in different ways. But I think, I don't think we ever did a proper mental health assessment of the people in this country. And more and more, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing signs where it needs to be addressed. I've had a couple of complaints, even recently. We know, we know the, the persons who show the signs of mental health. But the question, um, Madam Speaker, that I don't see anyone addressing is what are we really, really doing about it? Well, these persons go around, they do disruptive things, they complete their hours com being complained to the police, but nothing happens. They're left to roam over streets. And only when they do something bad is when everybody starts to jump up and, and try to do something then. I think we need to be proactive. The persons in this community who we know have mental challenges. We, I think we know who, who they are. There are other cases we might not be aware of. A person may do a good job of masking their mental health situation. But there are those who we are quite, quite aware of. And as I say, we need to not wait for something to happen, but to be proactive and put something in place to address this issue. Madam Speaker, I just want to thank you for giving the opportunity to say a few words on any other business, as I missed most of the sitting today, but I thought it fitting that I should join the overseas minister on Enagara today. I think it was the only sister island that he visited, and I felt it necessary to go there and show my presence, my appreciation, and to have a good chat about him. He's an environmentalist at heart, and the Gara is a pristine and a beautiful place, and I thought it quite fitting for him to go there and to see it for himself and to have a dialogue with him and other any guardians about Enegara. To make sure we take care of Enegara and Enegara can come into its own in due time. I fully support the move by him to go to Enegara. So Madam Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words and I'll take my seat at this time. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on the Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just say a few short words before we adjourn. Madam Speaker, um, as we customarily do, uh, we wish condolences to all persons in our community who have lost loved ones. And persons in the Virgin Islands community who are going through a difficult time. And we want to let persons know uh, that we're here for you and we care for you. And we're working our best to address whatever challenges in our role as legislators and ministers. Madam Speaker, uh, before I go too far, I want to address two matters raised by the leader of the opposition. Um, first was um, erroneous reports that I slept on the floor of the airport in Antigua. Uh, Madam Speaker, this is something I've addressed before and I'll address it again. Under no circumstances did I sleep on Antigua's airport floor. And um, hopefully, Madam Speaker, we can put that matter to rest um, because we have lots of very important matters that we have to discuss as a Virgin Islands people. I think um, that false information being put out there was, was reckless. Um, there's a lot of reckless information that's being put into the public sphere these days, uh, I think for malicious purposes. Um, but Madam Speaker, um, the Bible tells us no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And there are lots of acts, lots of uh, arrows being pointed in my direction. Um, and I think it's a sad thing that it takes place, Madam Speaker. 
Most of it is because of politics. And it's sad to see how politics causes us to seek to tear each other down and destroy each other. You know, I, I have persons who, they even go as far as taking my, my father's um, unfortunate circumstances to try to use it against me politically. I mean, that's how low they stoop, just for politics. Uh, we, we just passed a National Sustainable Development Plan, Madam Speaker, and I reflect on, I reflect on how we as a Virgin Islands people have survived some of the worst and, and, and most difficult circumstances known to, to mankind. And the way that we made it through was through love, through neighborliness, through taking care of our fellow man, fellow woman, our brothers and our sisters. And we've gained some level of prosperity. And now we are at each other's throats for the sake of power and all types of other things. And Madam Speaker, I just, I just think it's, I think we're better than that as a community. And of course, we're in the political season. And you'll hear all types of things in the political season just for the sake of power. And I just ask persons to keep their heads on. Keep a good head on your shoulders. Don't get caught up in the madness. Because when the political season is over, we will still have to live with each other and survive with each other. Let's see if we can conduct ourselves in such a way that would be befitting of persons of such a noble lineage and persons whose ancestors work hard to get us here. Let's conduct ourselves in such a way, Madam Speaker. So I'm thankful for those persons who have been praying for me because when you see um, persons who are intent to destroy you for whatever particular reason, you know, the, you say we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and high places. And we have to have persons who pray for us uh, when we are being attacked by the enemy. By no stretch of the imagination am I a perfect individual, as we are all um, flawed. We all fall short of the glory of God, but I feel privileged to be loved by our Creator. I feel blessed and highly favored every day uh, for the opportunity to be able to serve the people of the Virgin Islands in the capacity as the Premier, as a Minister, as a Legislator. It's something I take seriously uh, because, of course, I want to use my gifts my skills, my opportunities to be able to make the Virgin Islands a better place. And I'm, I'm humbled by the opportunity, and I see the opportunity for my colleagues and I to improve things for the people of the Virgin Islands, and it pleases me. When I see the Minister of Education full steam ahead, uh, when I see her passion for education in the Virgin Islands, and for young people, and seeing them meet their full potential, coming from teaching at the high school, and coming from being um, a, 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 a college student at H. Liberty Stout Community College, and having the opportunity to impact these institutions, you know, it gives me a great sense of pride. Uh, when I see the minister um, for communications and works, and you see his brain walking, and how to improve some, some aspect of the society. It, it gives me great pride. I was in the traffic the other day, and this is at five o'clock. And I'm going around the, you know, the, we did the one way, you know, between the roundabout and the Cutlass Tower. And I'm saying to myself, this is supposed to be rush hour traffic. And I'm, and I'm not seeing any, I'm barely seeing any vehicles on the road. 
And I could remember, I could remember um, before that change was made, you'd be there on that street, I think it's the Castro Street right there between uh, Bobby's and the parking lot there, and you'd be stuck there for times. Stuck there for times. And just through the, the genius, the ingenuity of, of the minister, just through using his intelligence, he made a change and he was able to improve things for the people of the Virgin Islands. And we can have a million other examples where we've been able to improve things. And that gives me a great sense of pride. Now, Madam Speaker, it's so easy to find problems in the Virgin Islands. And yes, we should identify the problems, bring attention to them so that they can be solved. But some persons find it easy to be able to just go around the Virgin Islands identifying problems. And that's how we will say that we're relevant. It's easy to solve, find problems because they're all over. What's difficult is to go ahead and solve those problems. And that's a problem, that, that's something that we have to do together. We have to solve these problems together. The cabinet has a role, the House of Assembly has a role. The civil service has a role. Private businesses have a role. Civic society has a role. Sometimes when you hear people speak, uh, you, you would think that um, a, a minister is to be blamed for every single thing that goes wrong in the Virgin Islands. No, um, it's difficult to solve problems and it's easy to identify them. But we have been appointed for a time such as this. And we, every time they, we see a problem, we keep knocking them down one by one. And whenever we solve a problem, they just, they, they don't even, half the time they don't even say thank you. <laughs> Most of the persons who are bringing attention to these challenges, they just move on to the other sets of problems and act as though that problem that you solved never existed. You know, that's, that's, that's a technique that is used. But I say give Jackie Jacket and, and, and give credit where it is due. And let's just continue tackling the problems as, as we're confronted by them. Some of these challenges are decades old. Decades old. But we just put our shoulder to the plow and we continue to do the work on behalf of the people. Sometimes these solving these problems take time, they take resources, they take creativity, but we get the job done and we don't take no for an answer. Uh, Madam Speaker, the other issue had to do with increments. And I I'm sure it was by mistake, Madam Speaker, but the, the media never picked up my announcement during the budget debate that increments would be paid. I said during the budget debate in December, Madam Speaker, that I instructed the financial secretary to find the money to pay the increments. Some money was budgeted, and we have a cabinet decision, something that will be coming to the cabinet soon, where we will be able to identify exactly the cost for the payment of increments. But you have a lot, lots of persons who are agitated, who are anxious about increments. And I have already announced that increments will be paid to our hard-working public servants. And this administration previously has paid, I believe, two sets of increments. Um, so I don't want anybody to get the impression that this administration has not been paying increments in very difficult circumstances, going through a pandemic, when obviously revenues were down because tourism was shut down. Okay? We have still committed ourselves 
to the payment of increments. Uh, you know, I, I think we need uh, information sharing in the society which is supposed to help inform people about what's taking place. Not just what's salacious and what causes the most um, talk and the most gossip. We have to help persons understand what is taking place in our society and we have to seek information from the right sources. Madam Speaker. So I'll say it one more time just in case somebody didn't hear it. I have already announced the payment of increments for our hard-working public servants. I have instructed the financial secretary to find money. Money has been budgeted. If additional money needs to be budgeted, we will get it. Our cabinet will be considering a paper uh, where we will be able to make a decision on the payment of, of the increments in terms of exactly how it will be done. And we'll report uh, further to the people of the Virgin Islands. Uh, Madam Speaker, on the matter of the Anigata Airport, uh, being international, receiving international visitors, Madam Speaker, I've been reliably informed by the Deputy Premier Minister of Communications and Works who has been in touch with the airport authority and the airport authority has been in communication with the immigration department that there's a matter that is, will soon be resolved that will allow for Anigada to receive international visitors through the airport. So I want to assure my honorable colleague in the ninth district that that's something that we are working on and will soon be resolved because we understand the importance of all our sister islands and the fact that the sister islands, even more so than Tortola, rely heavily on tourism. And while, just as I said, Madam Speaker, uh, some persons like to paint a picture as though we don't care about those persons in the sister islands. And I've, I've watched this government work over going on four years now. And, and we care for the people in the sister islands. And we recognize that in the sister islands, you not, don't get the type of service you deserve. And we are working hard to be able to solve those challenges. And certainly I'm grateful that we have a representative. We have representative for the ninth and the second and at large representatives who constantly remind us about the needs of the sister islands. And um, we won't take our eye off the ball. We'll keep um, focusing on the needs of sister islands and how we improve them. And same with that I described. We take a problem and we, we, we solve them. We solve them, we keep knocking them down one at a time. Madam Speaker, I'm gonna say a little bit about the visit of overseas territory minister, Lord Goldsmith. Madam Speaker, I see um, the media has communicated that the visit of Lord Goldsmith is shrouded in secrecy. Uh, very dramatic, uh, Madam Speaker. I, I told the Virgin Islands community weeks ago that Lord Goldsmith would be visiting the Virgin Islands. Certainly, it is far from a secret. I made it clear that I was in discussions with Lord Goldsmith in London, and we would continue our discussions when Lord Goldsmith came to the Virgin Islands. And none of that is a secret. 
Madam Speaker, the, the itinerary of the Minister of the Overseas Territories is handled by the Governor's Office. So certainly I'm not sure why I'm being blamed for um, the, govern the um, sharing of information about Lord Goldsmith itinerary. But be that as it may, Madam Speaker, I'm happy to report that myself, members of the Cabinet, and also members of the House of Assembly were able to meet Lord Goldsmith. I had a meeting with him yesterday morning, uh, followed by a meeting with the Cabinet and Lord Goldsmith. Lord Goldsmith was also able to have a meeting with the leader of the opposition. And he had a, we had a reception late in the evening where persons were able to interact with the minister. And of course, the minister addressed persons at the reception. And just to say, of course, we discussed matters of mutual interest. Uh, similar to what were discussed in London, we discussed uh, Lord Goldsmith has a great passion for the environment and he's responsible for, as a minister for climate, environment, etc., along with the overseas territories minister. So we discussed matters as it pertains to how he could support within his position uh, the Virgin Islands as it pertains to environmental matters. Also discussed uh, support in other areas in terms of the development of, of our economy, uh, the, the, the reform program that we're on. And of course, uh, we had discussions about uh, the order in council. And you will expect, Madam Speaker, um, that Lord Goldsmith will be addressing uh, the Virgin Islands community um, tomorrow. So I don't want to preempt uh, too much anything by uh, Minister Goldsmith. So I would just say to the Virgin Islands community uh, to tune into the Government Information Service on tomorrow and um, there will be an address by Lord Goldsmith. And nothing for anybody to be concerned about or worried about because our interaction was very positive. And I think we are further cementing, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, the very positive engagement that we've had with the United Kingdom as we push for the best interests of the people of the Virgin Islands, including our democracy, maintaining our democracy here in the Virgin Islands. And I'm sure, of course, when persons um, listen to the address by Lord Goldsmith, persons will have more to say um, and more to discuss about it because, of course, it's a very topical matter, our relationship with the United Kingdom government. But no one should be confused about the interest that I represent and that this administration represents. It's the best interest of the people of the Virgin Islands. And we have to, have to, we have to continue the conversation about our relationship with the United Kingdom. But what is clear is that we have to strengthen our institutions and give people the confidence that they need that we have the checks and balances within our society so that we can aspire to greater self-governance and self-determination. Uh, that is the goal that we should all be striving for, to have a, 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 a greater measure of um, self-governance and autonomy as other people in the world have. That is what we should aspire to. Uh, and what goes hand to hand in that is the progressive development of our institutions and the strengthening of, uh, of the elements of a model democracy like 
transparency, accountability, adherence to the rule of law, uh, delivering uh, for the people in such a way where they get value for their money, e delivering uh, effective uh, public services for the people, giving them opportunities through education, uh, economic opportunities through the development of the economy, uh, all, uh, taking care of our environment, all of the things enshrined in this sustainable development plan. You know, this, this is what our aspiration is. And we want the United Kingdom to assist us in whatever way possible as we walk that road. And we want assistance from other development partners, whether it's the OECS, whether it's CARICOM, whether our friends in the United Nations, whether it's, um, you know, Africa, um, any, any of our friends from around the world, Latin America, etc. That is our aspiration. Uh, Madam Speaker, there's a lot more to say. Um, we have a very uh, short session as we approach the dissolution of the House. Uh, so, so, Madam Speaker, we'll try to be as efficient as possible. Um, and we'll be soon coming back to this House um, to debate um, the Police Act. Uh, and we want to encourage persons, Madam Speaker, to read the Police Act. This Police Act was introduced in the last session. It may have been introduced in the session before, I'm not sure. Um, but the Police Act has been around for a while, but some amendments have been made to it. So we have brought it here as a new bill, and we want persons to read it backwards and front. And certainly, of course, we'll make available an uh, email for persons to send their comments um, on the Police Act. And you'll still have opportunities through, um, I would say, um, the Premier's office. Of course, uh, security is a subject that falls under the Governor, and I bring legislation to the House of Assembly on the Governor's behalf. So I would be happy to receive any comments at the Premier's office on the Police Act. Uh, we'll also provide an email address. We'll have make sure it's loaded up on the Government Information Services website uh, so that persons can can provide that feedback. But please, please, please read that Police Act. Let's send it around on WhatsApp. Let's get it into all the groups. Let's not give anybody an excuse to say that they have not seen it. As I said before, it has been introduced before, so it's not new. Wide-ranging public consultation was done on the Police Act. I myself went around with the police officers and we had meetings on every single island and in, in various communities. And we had good feedback and good discussion on the Police Act. And I'm asking everyone to be able to read it. Uh, some changes have been made based on the consultation and based on further stakeholder consultation. And we want everyone to have the opportunity to read and see this act. Uh, so that when we come and do our second reading, which we intend to do uh, next week, uh, we can do so uh, with persons having had the benefit of reading it. So, Madam Speaker, um, as always, I thank you, uh, the clerk, the deputy clerk, and, and the House of Assembly staff um, for all you do to facilitate these meetings and certainly, um, we look forward to coming back to this honorable, honorable house um, so that we can uh, continue to do the work of the people. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, again, I want to let the people of the Virgin Islands know that we love them, we care for them, and we're working hard for them. And um, I, I look forward to continuing working hard for them. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Premier. I call upon the clerk. Item number 10, adjournment. Thank you. I call upon the Premier.
Madam Speaker, I move a motion to adjourn the House until Friday, Friday the 10th of February at 1 p.m. No, 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 at 10 a.m. Madam Speaker, I move a motion to adjourn the House to Friday the 10th of February at 10 a.m. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Second the motion. Honorable members, a motion has been moved and seconded for this house to be adjourned to Friday, 10 February, 2023 at 10 a.m. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The motion is passed. This house is adjourned to Friday, 10 February, 2023 at 10 a.m.